phone up here just for a second. Um, give me a minute, I'll let you all join and do what you're gonna do. Wait for you all to join. Hope the camera's coming through clear. Hope the audio's nice and clear. Let you all do what you're gonna do. I'll leave that for a minute. Just gonna get everything all sorted. We've got two 1210s. Might strip both down, all depending on time limitations. We'll give it a minute, let everybody join. basics together that we need for this video. We've got one slight little problem though, everybody. Uh, my plan was I got a Microsoft Surface tablet that I was planning on reading all of the comments out on. It's decided to tell me that everything on it is out of date and I found that out about 10 minutes before hitting live on this. So comments, if you do leave any, they will be answered after the video if i catch them all before i stop the video i'll go through them so so i'm sorry about that but right so we've got two 1210 mark twos they've come into me for a service these are going to obviously be stripped down before i do anything they've already had the initial testing um they've been physically plugged in they've been well mixed on because they still function so i can get to grips if there's anything there that's hidden that my customer would not be aware of Next step now is to strip everything down. This is very handy for anybody out there that not only is stripping them down to the plinth to have things powder coated or resprayed, and they want to do it themselves, and they can see how to rebuild the turntable in, you know, from start to finish, you can strip the deck down. And if you're then going backwards in reverse, you can then put the deck back together. It looks daunting, it really isn't. I've been doing this for many, many, many years now. Stripping down a Technics turntable, no matter what the model of any of the old legacy models are, is a very straightforward job to do. And as long as you take your time and don't rush, you will not break anything, okay? This is also very handy as well, this video, because not only am I gonna be stripping this down, for those that have been asking me about a step-by-step -step video on things to look out for when you're buying turntables, you know, and you're obviously a bit scared of what to look for. You're wondering if you're buying a Franken deck. This is going to help you as well. So give me a second. We're going to grab the first Technics. I tr might try and do both of them if I can get a chance. But get, grab it. We're going to put the camera up here. It's going to be facing downwards. You ain't got to stare at my ugly mug for the whole video. And um, I've got the basic parts that we need. All you're going to need to do so, guys, is either obviously a low power drill. You need a hand Phillips screwdriver. Very, very important for one reason. I'm now going to tell you in a minute. Uh, a micro Phillips screwdriver, which is what you use actually to, to detach the, um, the power switch itself from inside the strobe assembly. You need that. Otherwise, you're not going to be taking that anywhere. Um, obviously, a little pair of snips, electrical snips. Very, very important as well. Um, right, let me stop talking now. We're going to grab it. I'll move the camera up here now. And um, yeah, like I said, anyone that leaves comments, anything at all, I can't get back to you until after the video. I'll try and get it towards the end of the video and answer them live. But my tablet's decided to not play ball. We'll get that sorted for the next one. I'll bring my iPad down and do this next time. So give me a second. I'll move the camera. And I'll go and grab this turntable. And we'll give you a brief overview and everything on it. And strip the thing down live on video. All right, so give me a second. All right, let's move the camera. Let's see. Let's see, shall we? First things first, can you hear me okay? I mean, you're not going to see anything at the moment because I haven't put anything down, but can you get the idea? Move the cable out of the way, my arm out of the way. All you see is white. You see my manly hands with me really, really nice fetching black gloves on. Very important as well. You don't want to get any rubbish on your hands or cleaning instruments or anything at all. Right, let's get the first turntable then. Um, let's go with this one. 
let's go with this one then. So, I'm going to sit on my stool and do this at the same time. Okay, that's the one. Super stuff. Now, can we all see this okay? Is this coming through okay? I can appreciate this is probably going to be, no matter what way I do this, it's going to be in reverse. <laughs> so it's the back camera. Right. So 1210 Mark II, this thing is coming to me, or both of them are coming to me for a service. Like I said, I've had an initial test already. Use condition. Original power cable, which is a molded power cable, which you can all see on here. How you doing, Ryan? I can actually still see everybody's comments from the way that I've got the phone angled, so I'm going to keep looking up. If I miss any, then I'm sorry. But either way, molded original power cable. Depending on the condition of that cable, I'm either going to take that off, snip it off, and pop a new cable on, or we've, if there's no breaks in the cable and it's still in a good, usable condition, then we'll pop that back on. We've got the gr grounding cable, this is obviously original. Anything that isn't original on this is the end connectors for the audio cable. Now, the connectors have been changed, but the cable itself should still be original. We'll find that out when I take the arm apart. Let's quickly plug this deck in. Now, I'm really sorry that the camera's in reverse. I can see that on here, it's mirrored. We'll get this resolved for the next video that I do live. But either way, 1210 Mark II. Okay, all powers up. It's obviously going to spin in reverse because of the camera. Still got lamp working. Zero lock is still functioning. If we go to 3.3, we've got 3.3. If we go to plus six, we've got plus six. Let's go to the minus range now. Minus 3.3, we've got 3.3. Um, yeah, so that's actually working. So what I will attempt to do before I do anything with this is either strip down this unit, depending on the condition of the carbon track. And if it can be rebuilt and it's still in full working order with no nasty wear marks on the carbon track, then obviously we can reuse the slider. If not, we'll pop a brand new aftermarket unit in, which will then mean that your 3.3 will be just over two and a half on each side with a plus six at either dead on plus six just before or just after. That's the way that these sliders are designed. Uh, so hundreds of these sliders with absolutely no issues whatsoever. Massive, massive shout going out to DJ Spares as um, he's your go-to guy when it comes to pitch controls if you're in the UK. Outside of the UK, 1200s.com. Huge shout out going out to them at Christian at 1200s.com. That's where you get your sliders from, guys. Right, let's, uh, let's start with this. So obviously I've really checked the the range for the pitch, 33 and 45 switches are still working. Speed selection switch over is fast and is smooth. And like I said, the original lamp you can all see is still functioning as well. Start and stop brake adjustment seems okay as well. When you hit the start and stop, it spins back slightly. There is a particular rotational point you're meant to stop this at, but the fact that it does stop and spin back is a good sign as well. So we'll unplug this now from the power, because we're not going to need that anymore. Pop take this tie off of the arm again. What I'd recommend doing for anybody that sends turntables down to me by courier, don't use plastic ties. Unless your turntables, the arms are scratched already or scuffed or in bad condition, you need to have things replaced, tend to stick to fabric ties, okay? Um, if you're gonna go down the cable tie route or the twisty tag route like this one here has, Get some fabric around them or something that's going to protect the tube. You don't want anything really scratching the arm. These are fairly robust, but this is in actually in pretty nice condition. And once I've cleaned this up, I'd imagine this would be a very nice turntable. Um, but it's very important to just to make sure that you don't scratch that arm. Just for more OCD sake more than anything. The lever lift is working. Anti-skate knob isn't loose. That's working as expected. Even the rear weight on the back is all good. Right. Okay, let's do what I would normally do with the screws, the bolts, etc. So if you are looking, say for an example, this turntable, you have just gone to go and view this. You are in somebody's house at the moment. You've asked them a million questions online and you're unsure of what to look at. You get all overexcited. You decide to turn the turntable on, 
pow, away you go, you get them home and something happens because you haven't checked things properly. This is the video you want to be checking as well, guys, okay? Just a brief overview of things to check over um, on the 1210, 1200, any of the models, okay? So like I've just shown you originally, powering the deck on, without <laughs> power on but help, wouldn't it? So powering the deck on, checking the actual strobe adjustment on with regards to the pitch trim. It's not massively, massively important. The majority of uh, customers that bring these turntables into me are having the aftermarket slider units replaced anyway. Changing the slider unit is not a bad thing. It's highly, highly recommended. Obviously, you've already, <laughs> you've more than likely already gone over the lifespan of the original unit within this deck. It could be 30 or 40 years old. And what tends to happen is, if you add these from new, you'll find that if you're like me and you spend the majority of your time in the plus range, obviously me playing classic 90s trance all the way up to hard dance and harder techno, I tend to either start my tracks at one and I'm usually between one and four or five mainly when I'm playing trance, 90s trance and early 2000s. When I'm playing techno, I tend to be all the way up the other end, okay, depending on where I'm taking it, if we're going from trance to techno. So what I'm basically getting at is the minor section of your pitch, I never use it. I very, very, very rarely ever use the minor section of the pitch. So if you've had a set of turntables from new and then all of a sudden it's just gone to a point of one minute you can mix, you may find that one turntable locks in fine, but the other one starts to drift and things don't start to lock properly. And you always find it's within the range that you're mixing. The first thing I'd expect you to do or ask you to do is to mix the same two records that you, you can mix with the back of your hand. So if you've got two records in particular that you know you can mix with your eyes closed and you know that there's no issues, and you, obviously you're finding it hard on one deck or on both decks, do yourself a favour, put those records on your decks, move them all the way down to minus, or get halfway between the minus, and try mixing those exact same two records in the minus section of the pitch. Because if you think of it logically, your lock's obviously a 0% lock. Makes no difference to you. If you're a DJ, you're probably never really ever going to use it. It's more of an annoyance and a hindrance more than anything. But if you are mixing music, you usually start your tracks at 0 or plus 1. I know I do. And you're always up in the minor positive side of the range. R&B DJs, hip-hop DJs, yeah, you're going to be all over the show. But for the majority of people that mix house, techno, trance, tech house, disco, funky house, etc., you're not going to be starting your tracks at minus. So it's a pretty good chance that you don't really use that area. And if you don't use that area, in theory, if you've had them from new, that slider area has never been used. Okay, so what I'm saying is, pop it on the negative, get it about halfway in between, stick a track on each record, and try mixing your tracks at a slower speed. If you find that they lock better, and you can get them to lock like you would have done in the positive range, then you know you have wear on the carbon track of that slider or the track itself is very dirty. I would put more money on the fact that the slider unit is heavily worn and that is when you know that you are due a replacement. Same thing goes if you move down the range and you start to get wobbles on the platter. So if you find it spinning around and you slowly start to move it, and all of a sudden it'll start to, the strobe dots will start to move, they'll start to flutter around, they'll start to juggle. It's a very, very big chance that your slider has dirt on the carbon tracks and it needs cleaning anyway. And if that is the case, I'd highly recommend, again, replacing the slider unit over. So that's the first thing you check. I get asked all the time by customers, oh, well, I'm starting to have drift issues. Have you had them from new? Yes, I have. Mix in the minus. Mix in the minus on both decks. Do you still have drift issues? Never tried it. Okay, try it. <laughs> Do it first. Because that will be the telltale sign as if you, whether you need a new slider or not. Okay, that's the first thing. Second thing, pop-ups when you hit them. Now I hear this all the time from a lot of people regarding pop-ups that when you push the buttons, now they fire straight up. You can rebuild the assemblies. You can put like a, a different um, silicon-based oil in there to uh, dampen the actual unit so it pops up slower. The problem that you have with dampening the unit is getting the, the right amount of... Um, of consistency between your slot between the actual pop-ups themselves sometimes you could do them they work perfectly and then the next time you go to go and push them up they'll be super slow sometimes you push the button up they won't move at all and sometimes it will work fine for a couple of weeks and all of a sudden pow it goes up strike fast again so best advice i would give you with that if you are going to dampen the parts around go with a high viscosity oil a silicon-based oil okay 
don't go too high and don't put too much on. If you do that, it's not going to move. Or it may work first of all, then it will slowly and gradually go up. Every single one of these decks that I tend to give back to customers now, they have a very low viscosity oil on there. It tends to park quite fast, but it's still smooth. None of this ultra slow, hi-fi maneuver rubbish. DJs just want to be able to push the button, they turn on, push it down, it turns off. This is the expect section. That is what you get when you get these back, okay? 33 and 45 switches, if you're going to view these as well, you should be able to feel some, like it's obviously they're tactile switches. The idea is to feel the tack underneath. So make sure it feels like it is physically clicking on the buttons. Now, these buttons, the 33 more than the 45, is more responsive in terms of touch. This could be a num number of multitude of things. It could be that the tactile switch is just gunged up with grime. Again, very, very old would be the original switches inside this unit, which would not have been taken apart. So it is a high chance that this, the actual tactile switches themselves are either tough and dirty and just old. And for the sake of a couple of quid, change them over. It really is a no brainer. It could also be that the plastic stems underneath these buttons because these are actually made out of plastic. People don't realize this. A lot of people think they're made out of metal. They're made out of plastic. If the stems are gunged up with grease and grime underneath or you spilt something in certain areas and it all gets gunged up, you'll find that it's harder to push your buttons. Sometimes you could push them down. Sometimes you'll find that they don't want to push down and they also feel as if they shouldn't be moving at all. Same similar thing with CDJs. When you get tactile switches that wear out on CDJs, push the button down, nothing happens. But you don't, you, it's, it's as if you're holding it down and there's nothing there. Very, very common, not very expensive to resolve. Okay, so if you do have that on, on turntables you go to view, not a hard job to do. Well, it isn't hard if you know how to solder, but it's a very cheap job to have completed. Okay, um, arm assemblies. Now, again, arm assemblies, probably one of the most expensive parts on these turntables, and I can't stress it enough that people need to check these when they are buying these secondhand. Now, a lot of these turntables, this one's no exception, have seized arm assemblies. So what basically happens is you have the actual base of the arm itself, you have the ring section, which is the numbered section that goes around the sides, then you have the actual tone arm assembly base itself for the toner. There's a thread, there's threads going around the base, threads going around the adjuster ring, and threads going around the main assembly. The actual, what I class this as, is if you get to a point where you set it to an adjustment from new and you've never touched it and you've locked it down, chances are you're not going to be able to remove this very easily. Um, basically, all of the internal petroleum J that was used when they originally built this unit has turned into a nasty brown green goo that's hardened almost into almost like a chemical metal underneath. And that is why you cannot move the adjuster. Sometimes like this, for an example, you probably can't make this out on the camera where you can see here the actual the assembly itself wants to move. But the adjuster base is very firm. When I grab hold of the adjuster and try to move that, it does look like it wants to move underneath. So there are a few ways of obviously getting this loosened up. Um, you can use penetrant oil if you want to do this at home. I'm not going to go down the extent of telling you exactly what I do with this because it defeats the object of you bringing things in for a service. But if you want to get around this issue, nine times out of ten of penetrant oil, just to get things moving and get you out of the, you know, get you out of trouble, penetrant oil is the best way to go. Usually as well, with the height adjuster rings, it's very, very important. If everything does move on the arm assembly, make sure that you can line up the zero to the notch line on the arm itself, but also make sure that there's good distance between, if there's a cartridge on there or a head shell of a stylus, make sure there's good distance between the underneath of the stylus and the plinth. Your stylus should not be touching the plinth, okay? Is a, is, this is obviously a telltale sign that the arm tube is bent or there is damage to the plastic central section. Again, this is made out of machine plastic. It's not made out of metal. Um, so you need to check that. If you find that the height adjustments are seized at a higher point, so in other words, there's a very thin gap distance between the top of the height adjuster ring and the actual locking point where it tells you to lock so you can calibrate the number. If you find you've got a finger's distance, where the arm has been raised up too high and you cannot move the arm, again, it's going to be much harder for you to judge when you view this in person if there's no particular damage with the arm tube. The easiest way to do this is look at the turntable from its side and have a visual check across the front of the side of the arm. You'll be able to see if the arm tube is either straight 
or angled, okay? If you have an autophon concord or a head shell with a cartridge and stylus mounted on, best advice I would give you is take it with you, okay? Take it with you, physically screw it onto the end of the tone arm section, and you'll be able to see a, a visual representation of the angle of the stylus if the arm is bowed, and also the angle as to how it's sitting, okay? This is something that you need to do. Bearings is another one. Bearing assemblies. Now, this is a very, very expensive thing all in all with the arms regardless. I mean, I don't make the arms anymore for these. Anyone that wants the arms for these now, you have to buy the ones from the newer models now. You can fit Mark 7 arm assemblies, the top section here. So the support bracket, central pivot system with the pivots, bearings, central plastic section uh, with the arm tube, wiring and socket. You can pop that straight onto the original base. So the Mark 7s, you can pop them straight on, have yourself a nice black arm tube. Do the same with the C-series. All of the newer series will fit straight on, okay? But you cannot just take the arm assembly out and pop a new arm assembly straight on. It's completely different, different system altogether. But with a bit of know-how, you can fit the newer system on. Not the cheapest thing to do, but if you want absolute pinpoint precision, this is the best thing that you can do. So let's say you're a hi-fi you're a hi-fi user, you're not a DJ, and all you want to do is spend the majority of your time lifting the needle up or using the lever lift, popping your stylus on the record and playing records, okay? You don't want any jumps, skips, where the bearing is deciding it's going to move such a way and then stop and stop and stop because no free movement. So you need to put a new arm on. Simple as that. The amount of these that I get through my door that have damaged bearings now is insane. What happens is you have pivot points so the top of the arm, where you see is classed as a flathead screwdriver, is probably the easiest way of describing it to everyone that's watching. Flathead screwdriver section, outer, outer ring lock. You undo the outer ring lock, remove the pivot. The other end of the pivot is a fine point, a very fine needle point that goes into a ring of ball bearings. Okay, There's a, there's a bracket, a plate, a plate on top with ball bearings underneath. And the idea is that when you move from left to right, the plate, which sits on top of the bear, on top of the pivot, keeps the pivot still and the bearings will move the arm left and right. So the bearings will move, the ball bearings will move inside, depending on the movement of the arm. So let's say you are, you don't know what you're looking at and you think the arm, the arm might be damaged. Telltale signs of this is obviously going to be marks across the arm, scratch marks going down the tube itself. But also if you grab hold of the arm and you physically get it like this, and you try and rock it backwards and forwards. I'm not talking about movement with the base, but just between the top central section here and the main support bracket, you'll see that there'll either be looseness there or tight or over tightness and loose when you move it in different directions. Okay. Uh, another way of telling this is obviously going to be letting, seeing if the customer or whoever you're buying these from will actually let you use them. If someone's deceitful and they know there's a problem, the last thing they're going to do is let you test this out. As far as they'll be concerned, it's a set of 1210s. They are what they are. You either give them the money or you don't. As far as, far as it's concerned, if it's a good price, that's all they're bothered about. You get shops that will sell you turntables that have been serviced. They come with warranties. In that respect, if you're going to go and see turntables, checking bearings and things, doesn't really matter because you get a warranty. If there are issues, you give the turntable back. They resolve the problem or swap the issue or swap the tone arm over or swap whatever they're going to do. Give you another turntable, right? But... The arm assembly is probably the most expensive part I class on the deck. Yes, you can change tubes. You can buy replacement arm tubes. You can get them from China. That's no hard thing. Getting them in the right machining arm quality and the right weight was an issue before. That's not an issue now. Bearings, though, having to remill the housings, change the bearing over from the original bearing into a different style bearing, making sure everything is central, lined up perfectly, bearing adhesive, physically sat in the right location at the right angle. If you haven't got the right tools, it's game over before you even begin, all right? That being said, if you are using your turntables for phase, okay, so you obviously see you know what phase is. Phase is the little box that you put on top of any record, connects up to Serato or Tractor, virtual DJ and record box, I believe. Uh, you can play digital vinyl, or digital, it is technically digital vinyl, but a digital box that sits on top of a record, gives a time code signal as it spins around wirelessly to your computer through your sound card or however you want to do it with the RAIN system. Um, 
and you don't need the arm. There's no physical need for the audio cables. So you, you see my green camouflage deck I've completed, which doesn't have an arm, has a plate with no audio cables, purely because you don't need the arm. So if you're buying a set and you want to basically turn the Technics into a Rain 12, which is just an all-in-one media controller that looks like a turntable but doesn't have an arm assembly, you can do that with this. You can take the arm out. The arm is connected to the audio cables and grounding cable, held in place with three screws and a separate screw that goes to the top of the pitch control with another grounding point, which you have to undo, whole arm will lift out. The arm section, the audio section of the turntable is separate to anything else inside. Yes, there can be interference and noise produced from components on board, etc., power supplies and things, but this is a separate issue, okay? So we'll go through that when I strip the arm down. But yeah, make sure that there is no looseness in the arms. Make sure if they let you test them out that you play a record from beginning to end. Don't just put it through, you know, drop the needle on different areas and go, that plays fine. Make sure you play a, a record from beginning to end. If you've got a new record, best you take that with you. Take your cartridge. If it comes with cartridges, clean the stylus. Check the basics. Play it from beginning to end. Make sure that you can balance the arm as well. Pop your cartridge on. Find the floating point. Move your anti-skate so the arm will progressively move in and out freely. These are all very important things to check. But the arm, if you buy a pair second hand and the arm is damaged, you either change the bearing over or bearings, depending on worst case scenario. You'll need a new tube. You have to rewire this. I mean, usually people ask me to rewire the arms. It's not a necessity. It's a necessity. You haven't got to do this. But if you're changing the tube and the bearings and labor on top, you're already well, nearly halfway towards buying another arm tube and another arm assembly from a newer deck. So just bear that in mind when you are buying these decks secondhand. Feet is another one. Yes, you can buy 3D printed feet. There's a lot of these knocking around online now, spotted on the likes of like eBay, where people will sell on their own versions of the feet or their own take on the original feet for Technics. You find the majority of my either hardened rubber uh, with no flexibility really with them. Some of them are good quality copies. Some of them are just made out of plastic with the uh, the correct uh, thread size of bolt just to make sure they go on and they look good, but there's no movement, no nothing at all. So depending on what you're going to use your decks for, make sure the feet are in good condition. Make sure there's no cracks in the rubber. I'll show you that after as well. Right, let's start stripping this thing down, shall we? So you're going to start seeing parts vanish off the screen completely. Um... So you're not going to see exactly everything, but I'm going to, once the plinth has been stripped, I'll put everything down and show you an in-depth part as to what's going on. There are some people watching. I can see some um, some comments. So we've got, is that DJ For Real? Good to see you watching. We've got Mike Felicio as well. Or is that Feliciano? Was that? I'm sorry, I can't see your comments now. It's all vanished because the screen is literally there right above me. So um, either way, we've got a fair few people watching. So thanks for, thanks for tuning, guys. Let's get cracking, shall we? Now, this is going to be stripped down and service work completed, but I'm going to show you the basics of stripping this down. In fact, before we begin this, as you can see, this plat has come off fairly easily. You get a lot of these turntables where the, the magnet underneath the platter will literally be so tight onto the, onto the spindle itself in terms of magnetization underneath that it won't want to move, and you'll find that the spindle will get stuck. Best advice with this is a rubber like a little mini rubber mallet just give it a few light taps that will come off you don't need to use any penetrant oil or anything like that a couple of little sharp knocks on top of the spindle while moving the arm with your thumbs or fingers inside the actual holes here this will lift off bottom of the platter as you can see here in the central section i get a lot of these that come through second hand that have actually been reshaped because they tend to be bent and things that actually bent out of shape. It needs to be as close as a perfect circle as you can get there. And also make sure that the magnet has no nasty chips, scuffs, nothing stuck around the outside, no debris or anything. Then you're good to go as well. Again, these can be quite expensive to buy if you're buying them second hand. Let's get this out of the way. I've actually got a two section rack section right in front of me so we can do this properly. Um, right, plastic cover for the pitch. This can either go one or two ways. Either this will come off very easily, like this one here has, or it can be tight on there. Under no circumstances, guys, do you put anything underneath the plastic of this, because it is made out of plastic. If you force anything under and try to wiggle it out, it's every chance that you will snap these clean. I've seen this happen so many times before. It is best to just leave it. Let's get, let's get my thing over here. There we go. That's better. 
It is best literally to just leave it as it is underneath, and I'll show you what to do afterwards with this. You also got the, the, the felt that goes underneath the knob as well. These are extremely cheap to buy online. You find a third party replacements, and if you're lucky, you can get genuine ones too. It is nothing special. It's a piece of felt. You can replace this. Okay, so let's get this out of the way. That's the first thing. The rear weight on this one here, not overly tight, it's not overly loose, it moves freely, it locks into place. There is a brass pin at the back that pushes this down with a little rubber gasket that means that you can actually thread the weight through the rear, through the rear of, the, um, of the arm assembly. That's coming off nice and smooth. Nothing really untoward to watch out on. You do tend to find that the rubberized sections at the back can come loose. You can adhesive these back down. So if you do find it, it comes off or it starts to flap away, there is a break point on, on the majority of these that you'll find they tend to pick away. You can re-glue that back down. That's not the end of the world. Use yourself a nice low tack adhesive that will go back down. Um, but yeah, that's nothing really untoward about this. It's all be nice and clean when the customer gets this back anyway. Right, let's start with the basics. Lever lift. So the lever lift itself is in grummy condition. I mean, you probably can't see this on camera. There's a lot of dirt on this turntable. What we're going to do is very gently grab hold of the arm, grab hold of the actual stem itself, give it a little wiggle, and you will find that will come straight out. Don't be too nasty with this. Don't pull on it too hard. You can snap the fixing point inside, but that's how you remove the lever lift itself. That can now go in there. Let's grab me other tool I completely forgot to get. Uh, where did I pop that? Give me a second, guys. That's the tool we're after. There's always something I forget whenever I'm doing live videos and doing these off the cuff. So what you've got now is the actual the lift, the lift itself. So you've got the lever, then you've got the lever lift. What you want to do is take the, uh, the lock off for the arm. Grab your flathead screwdriver. Don't just use any screwdriver that is the wrong size. If you use them that are the wrong size, you're going to churn apart the flathead screwdriver section in here. This is the correct size. And all you do on here, position it where you want it, anti-clockwise, nice and gentle. You haven't got to be too harsh with it until it moves around like it is here. Get the underneath, lift the arm up, move it out of the way. And there you go. And be careful, there's a spring inside. You probably can't make this out on camera, but there is actually a spring going around the fixing bolt inside the lift. You do not want to lose that, otherwise you're going to run into problems later on down the line if you want to use the rest. Let's put that now in there. I'm going to lock the arm back in. So that's now the lift out of the arm, including the lever itself. All right, we've now got the felt and the plastic cover or plastic knob off of the shader and off of the pitch trim and off the pitch area. Next step, plastic cover. Now, what I say to people whenever you view these and you're a bit, you don't really know what you're looking, well, you want to know what you're looking at when you're buying these second hand. If you have a set of decks that you're going to view and they have aftermarket cables, connections that are changed over, you're a bit unsure because it might have an LED kit in, things like that. Unless the customer, unless the person, I keep saying customer, sorry, unless the seller tells you, where they've bought this from and the background and history, they might be genuine. They might just tell you straight away, yep, I bought this from such and such shop. This is the person that did the work. These are the serial numbers, blah, 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 blah. This is what you need to do. But it isn't always the case. But removing the plastic cover is quite helpful to see the connections inside, which we're going to show you in a second. What I'm going to do is get this, instead of me messing around with different sizes, get my multi, multi tool over here. Uh, let's get the right tool. Let's get the right size for the screws on here, so bear with me. I tend to use my Weira tools to do this, but I'm going to do this using my... It's the wrong one. Here we go. Let's see if we've got this right. That's still, no, that's still too, too tight. There we go, lovely. Right, here we go. So you've got five plastic screws that go around the base. Depending on the age of these, you may find if anything's been spilt in this, they don't tend to come off very easily. The screws will. You don't need to use a drill or anything to undo these. 
I'm going to do this all by hand, I'm not going to use a drill or anything at all for this video, even with the base and uh, most importantly the four outer bolts that go around the corners of the base. There's a reason for that which I'm going to explain after I've shown you this, because we are going to be stripping this down. There we go, so that's five screws removed. So this plastic cover, as you can see, if I give it a little bit of tension, that's not coming off. <laughs> it wasn't coming off very easily. So there you go. So that, that to me, I can tell you straight away without even messing around with anything. This is an original condition. Technics has not been molested in any way. This has never been removed, never been removed to tamper with anything internally. So the plastic, plastic cover, like I say, held on with five screws, can get quite dirty, very easy to take off and clean. That can go over here out the way so what we're looking at here then guys we've got the wiring harness obviously the main board in the middle first so the main board the spindle we've got the wiring harness that goes to the pitch control area that goes for a separate pcb that you'll see in a minute we've then got down here the main operation based wiring harness this is what controls the start stop 33 45 and strobe plus on off switch is separate underneath but also attaches onto the underneath of the board Hence why I said you need a smaller Phillips screwdriver to remove the switch. So it all goes to the same area. The switch is actually the blue and red connection cables that are here. Go separately to everything else. But the operation base goes to this particular harness connection point here. Now, this one here is the pop-up assembly. Okay. So what we're going to do is just gently remove... The wiring harnesses now cable ties now i got a lot of stick off of this when i said about a video that i did with dj city about cable ties on fake turntables it distressed this very highly there's no such thing as a, a fake technics turntable okay there is no manufacturer out there that makes a fake technics panasonic never made a fake technics so i'm going to hit that right now when i was saying about cable ties that everyone jumped on the bandwagon about it's quite clear when you look at the way that the cables are positioned how tight they are here, how that they're, they're bunched up, etc. That to me is an honest turntable with honest cable ties that are from the original unit. Even the power cable, which is original, you can see on here the color shade difference between these and any other cable tie that you're going to use. It sounds petty, but it's true. You can tell by looking at the cable ties if they all match and are exactly the same and they don't look brand new, you know you've got an original. So, what we're going to do now. Very, very important with this and being very careful not to break into any wires on this. But I mean, I can obviously replace and repair these, but you will not be able to unless you know what you're doing. Is being very gentle, a nice sharp pair of clips and getting rid of the cable ties. Now, this is the thing that people take for granted. This turntable would have never been stripped apart or taken apart since it was manufactured. So these cable ties were put on the, from the factory when this would have been first been made. So I'm, I'm doing someone's work that was originally put on here 40 years ago. It's crazy. Absolutely crazy. So when I do things like this, I really do appreciate what, you know, the effort that's gone into getting this just right. There we go. It takes the slack off of the wiring harness here, as you can see, because you can move it out the way. So let's get the operation base wiring harness out the way completely. That now takes the slack off of the of the lamp assembly so we can now move this around being careful not to touch the thermal paste because if you get that on there it's a bit of a nightmare cleaning it off we'll now move that out of the way as such these are coming off fairly easily nothing untoward really to check one of the things i was stating before with some of these turntables where people will change over the main board or the fuse section with the power supply what you've got here is the two coiled wires. They actually, they're machined. There's usually a specific, there's a specific tool, if I can get my words out, a specific hand tool, which actually wraps these wires around the stems. Sometimes they're soldered on the top, sometimes they're not. But from new, from a factory, they're just wound round with a particular tool. They're not soldered into place. So if you were going to take this off, to do it for a bench power supply and do your troubleshooting, if there was a problem on the board, you could physically unwind these cables by loosely removing parts and then take the main board off with the transistor and just take everything off pop it to one side on your test bench and leave everything else inside the deck 
okay so again these were never shortened and just soldered on they were physically wrapped around with a special tool as you can see here with the cable tie that's already on here we're not going to touch any of that we don't need to what i am going to do though is i'm going to judge the power cable when i eventually do this the service work on this turntable is remove the cable tie here and physically clip off the power cable as close as you possibly can and there is a reason for this which i'm going to explain in just a second so that's the cable tie removed as you can see now i can now move the cable with the the silicon sleeve and going over the top now if you were to cut this if you got overzealous and went oh i'm just going to remove the cable any old way and you cut as high as possible obviously the more you remove the shorter the cable is going to be now necessarily it's not such a bad thing in this and you can work around it because there is a little bit of wiggle room with the cable so you can have the cable further forward and you know you've got enough cable to put it back on again so what i tend to do with this is cut this as close as possible to the fixing points on the board um it's no secret to this there's no hidden nasties or secrets to telling you this it's just common sense if you do it closer to the board it means once you remove the the actual the wrapped around cable with your desoldering electronic desoldering gum with new flux and new new wire new solder wire um you'll have nice clean points but you can also as you can see here there's enough cable there to pop the cable back on by moving it forward it was stripping off a bit of the plastic sleeving um you know stripping down the cable positive and negative pow jobs are good and you can do that you can take out the power cable completely you can pop a new cable on lots of ways that you can do this so what we're going to do now to remove that is physically remove if i can get my screwdriver is physically remove the two screws that hold in the, the plate for the power supply or not power supply for the power cable there we go who we got watching then guys i can see your comments to some extent now I have a few that keep popping up on there got a few people watching which is great thanks for tuning in if you caught my video yesterday obviously i am on the lookout for sponsorships and the membership is now live on the page i know it's a bit of a not most professional video i did last night but it was an on off the cuff video as i explained right so again power cable with plate comes straight out once you've clipped that we're going to put that to one side depending on the condition of the cable i'll do a visual inspection on this make sure there's no breaks in the cable make sure everything's okay and in full working order if i want to reuse this and it cleans up well we'll reuse this cable unless the customer has stated to replace the power cable that can go to one side we don't need that again now we'll leave everything else here intact i don't want to touch anything else on this board just yet we can put these cables back together. In fact, what we'll do, we'll loosely pop these like this, because what's the next step is to obviously turn this deck upside down. Um, if you're gonna do this at home and you're gonna strip this down, make sure that you don't just turn this upside down on a, on a hard surface such as this. You wanna make sure you've got something soft underneath this, otherwise you're gonna run into a world of pain. Now, some people do this with deck savers and things. It's not worth it unless you're gonna foam pad the inner section of them off. I'm gonna use a couple of blocks of foam just to do this while I've got people watching here. So this isn't the usual workbench that I do the soldering gear on. I've actually got another turntable on the workbench there already. What we're gonna do is move all of this out of the way. I'm gonna use, let's see if we can do it with this. It's a couple of bits of foam, just from another third party box that was sent to me. Let's see if this will work on here and sit properly without damaging anything. We're going to do this at an angle with the arm, see if I can get away with this. No. Right, okay. Let's use another alternative. I have a secondary alternative to this. I didn't think that was going to work, to be honest with you. Um, I have got... Let's get this. Hang on just a second, everybody. Here we go. Right, okay. The foam bumpered sheet that I have here, as you can see, it's nice and cushy for the turntable. A safe deck is a happy deck, as corny as it sounds. You don't want to be putting any pressure onto parts. Sorry, I just nudged the camera, didn't I? You don't want to nudge parts and cause yourself any problems. You want to make sure it's nice and firm, there's nothing moving on there. So you see, if I'd have used the foam, you would have ran into some problems there because the arm would have been moving around or would have been putting pressure on certain parts. 
And these are all things that you really don't want to be doing when you're stripping one of these down. Right, let's quickly grab a few other bits. See if we've got any comments popping up that I can quickly look at. Give me just a second. Uh, live chat, top chat, live chat, all messages are visible. Now that'd be handy. I had to take time to, try to fix some bodge monkeys work. Genuine dash two sliders. Yep, yeah, we know all about that, Ryan, don't we? We know all about that. Hope you're doing well, my friend. It was good to see you. I'm hoping your turntables are still running in lovely condition, considering they were meant to have been <laughs> serviced. Okay. Okay, so sit back on me stool. The feet will literally, from upside down, they'll go anti-clockwise. Do one at a time. You'll see they're very dirty. This is something that I also do as well. I don't just clean them, I polish them. Obviously, you're not going to be seeing that on video. Just want to show you how these come off. Some things to look out for. So the feet on this actually do look in good standing order. There's no breaks in the rubber. So what tends to happen is the rubber underneath can perish. You can tend to find that if they've been sitting for quite a while, they'll be pushed right down. There's a spring inside the actual, the, the foot itself, that if the, if the foot itself, anything underneath breaks or anything falls out and the spring falls out, the foot will droop, which will then result in an, an, a turntable that is not sitting correctly at the right height. You have to use more height on the back. You don't just fold these all the way through and then just put up with them. That's not what you do. You can do that if you've got a level work surface, and a lot of people tend to do this, but make sure they're level. Get yourself little miniature spirit, spirit bubble levels. You can put them on the corners. Really easy to do on the plinth. There's your feet. They can go over here, out the way. You don't need to see them ever again. Next time you see them will be when I rebuild the deck. In the next video that I do. Right, okay. I saw something about an ultra pitch. Nope, I've not touched ultra pitch, guys. Something I would like to look into at some point, but I've not actually had a single customer ask me for the ultra pitch modification. It tends to just be plus or minus eight and the odd person here and there that decides they want to have the extended range on Mark IIs with, you know, just how things are. Now, remember I said earlier about using a hand drill, being very careful, you need to use hand tools. The most important thing to do when you're removing any of these screws, because you have to understand they this would have not been removed since they were put in from the factory, unless somebody else has had a go at removing the bolts, right? Is these four. Well, mainly the front one near the operation base. The operation base screw, or the thread underneath, it's a plastic section and plastic thread. So this bolt that goes through, if you attempt to hit that with too much force, or, you tell, or even if you do it up the other way and you do it clockwise to tighten it back up, if you do that too much with too much force, you will break that. That is why the majority of these turntables, if you buy them secondhand and you try changing cables over yourself, this bolt is either there loose and dangling down, spinning around doing nothing, or doesn't feel like it wants to, you know, bite into the thread. That is why. So you don't want to be using drills really, or hand tools in that respect to take this apart. You have to use a screwdriver. It might take longer, but I'd rather take a couple of minutes longer undoing four screws and bolts than breaking threads and having to explain to a customer that the threads are broken because they've over-tightened them. You know, it's just not professional. It's best to do things properly. There we go. So they look like this. They're long, they fit straight through. We'll get that one out of the way. We'll do the same thing. With all the rest of these. Again, there's a bit of cobwebs and things over here. Ugh, lovely. They're coming out nice and easy. As much as the cobwebs on here, I'm expecting to find some nasties in this. Sometimes when you take these out, you'll find that the bolts themselves get stuck underneath the corners of the rubber. You can pry them if you're careful to remove them. Doesn't always happen. That's free. We'll get the fourth one. Obviously, like I said, if anyone's got any questions, feel free to fire them across on the, on the, the chat. If I can't get back to it during live, because I can't see it properly, then obviously I'll get back to you as soon as I can after the video. I'll respond to everyone's questions tonight. Or I'll do another video and answer your questions on the video. 
You've got six longer bolts that go around the outside of the turntable. As you can see here, they've basically got built-in washers that thread into the actual weight section of the center of the deck. So we'll remove these. I could do it with a hand drill if I want to. You're not really going to cause any problems by removing these with a hand drill as long as you use them with a you know a low low tension. Let's get them out of the way. Okay, let's get these out of the way. Hang on. Oh, stretch. Twelve screws on the outer screws as well. Might as well include that while I've got you here. Oh god, my back is killing me. Sorry, guys. The joys of riding bikes and being a DJ. So hunched over a bike, I ride a, I can ride my Ninja into work because my my Super Duke KTM Super Duke was. And if you've been following my channel, was attempted to. Well, it was stolen. And I found it the next day. So it's, it lives here. But the joys of riding bikes and carrying around vinyl. Obviously, these turntables don't get any lighter either, I can tell you that. Get between three and four pairs of these every week. So this particular one here is deck one of two. And of course, if, when I crack on with the second turntable, if it wasn't under camera, this thing, I can strip a turntable down in about 10 minutes. So it's not a particularly hard job. But like I say, I've been stripping these down and working on Technics turntables for just over 10 years now even from when I used to work for the DJ shops many moons back. So that's the first job. So we've got everything removed. Let's just double check here. We've got the four on the outside. You've got one, two, three, four, five, six of the longer bolts. And you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 on the inside, all are removed. That way we checked everything. We know there's nothing there. We know we can remove the, the main rubber base itself. It will flex slightly. If you have forgotten a bolt and you haven't removed one, you'll find that you just can't remove it. And it'll be quite obvious when you tend to try and look at the corners where it's tight down there, the bolts are holding it in. So what I tend to do here is go from the corners, get each edge and just be very careful moving them around. And eventually it will lift up nice and smoothly with the audio cable here. As you can see that you can either thread it through like I'm going to do here. This cable's going to be changed over and removed anyway. It makes no difference about what you do underneath here. It's all being changed. So there's the rubber base. As you can see, you've got dirt underneath. This is all going to be deep cleaned. All the recesses on the corners. Um, got the serial number in the corner there. So either 98 or 2008. I'm going to say it's a 98 turntable. Uh, January of 98, I'm going to guess that as is the date, which I can confirm when I'm doing the service work as well. We'll get that base out of the way. They're very, very hard wearing. These things were built like tanks, as you're probably all aware. This is the first one we ran into here. You can see that the actual the socket is loose. I don't know if you can see that on the camera. There you go. The actual socket hinge plate, the bolts are loose for this. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to just tack this down again with my Phillips. Just get them tight. If I have to reposition them at any point when I'm putting it back together, I can. This is the first thing I tend to check is make sure that everything is flush on these because Sometimes they don't sit at the right angle. You'll find that your dust cover sockets are sitting at an angle when you're looking at them. You can adjust the sockets themselves with two screws at the back and move the plates up. I'll probably do that on this when I finish the turntable off. Okay, let's take the outer screws for the weighted section out. So you've got, just to count this on here with you, so you've got one, two, so one, two, three, four, five, six bolts, screws, whatever you want to call them, bolts. Six screws, six bolts that hold this into place. So you, there's number one, number two. It's very, very, you'll be very careful when putting these back together as well. What I tend to find is mainly when people put these back together, this bolt here at the front, my, has my camera moved? Hang on a minute. Is that a bit better? Right, this one here. What I tend to find is because it's the lowest tack surface here with the actual section underneath, sometimes this can crack. If it does crack, it's not the end of the world. It will go back together properly. But again, be very careful when tightening the screws back up because you, you can over tighten them. And if you do, you can either break the thread for the bolt or the screw, whatever you want to call them, inside the threads. 
and you, you're gonna oh, you're gonna be in a world of pain. You don't want to be doing that, do you? There's one in here near the arm assembly, which we're gonna remove. If it wants to come out. This is magnetized, it should be coming out, but it's not. We'll get that in a second. Right, that's not what I'm gonna Let's get my grabber. Hang on a second, let's get my tweezers or grab tool that we're gonna use. Uh, let's go with let's get me tweezers. Get me metal tweezers, they should. Should lift out. If not, it doesn't really matter. I can get this without having to do this. In fact, we'll use my tool. Hang on a minute. Deep magnetizer. I don't understand as to how it's lost it because the entire section on here is magnetized. <laughs> it shouldn't do this. Let's try this again. There we go. That's number one. Happens with a lot of these. Doesn't matter how much you pay for tools. If you if you want to lose the, the magnet, they can. You have to then obviously use another tool to reactivate the magnet, which is what I've just done there. So as you can see now, we've got the weighted base inside the turntable. We've just tightened up the two sockets so they're not going to come loose anymore. So that's a good thing about stripping these down for a bit of a clean if you're going to do it. Obviously, you're not going to go down this extent if you're going to be buying them from someone. I mean, I'll just go, look, give me your money, piss off, right? Nice as possible thing. Um, but yeah, so we can now lift off carefully the weighted section. And as you can see here, there we go. That's going to sit up with the with the rubber base, in its own little dedicated area in front of where I'm working. This obviously isn't where I normally do my solder work or anything. Now, as you can see now, this is becoming much clearer to anybody that's watching this, just how simple the parts are to remove um, on these turntables. Now, working on parts, depending on what you're actually going to do, if you're good with a soldering iron, you've got an electronics background, or you're a bit of a hobbyist, then some of this you'll be able to do yourself, right? It's not hard in that respect. Main board, troubleshooting issues, that's different, okay? This is where the years of experience come into play and you give it to a technician, not necessarily just me, any te a technician that is familiar with these turntables that actually knows how to repair them, this is where things are gonna come in handy. But what you can see now is there's all these fabric self-adhesive ties or felt self-adhesive ties that are holding down certain areas. Um, there's a cable tie on here as well, which I'm gonna go through in a second. Let's start off with the pop-up assembly. So the pop-up itself, as you can see here, everything here, there's nothing soldered down, okay? You can remove them. The bolts that you have holding down the pop-up are very straightforward to remove. So we're gonna take that off. We're gonna undo the two screws. We're gonna remove this. Pop them with the other screws that we removed from the internals. Now, with the felt itself, what I tend to do with this, because these aren't, obviously these go straight in the bin anyway, the felts, we can either break the felt Sometimes they will tear fairly easily. So if I get this here with the cables and just pull like that, they come straight off. There's no damaging anything. Then all you simply do with the felt, self-adhesive felt, is just pull that off. We'll pop it to one side that'll go in the bin. And there's your pop-up assembly. Okay, we'll go through that. If you want to see it in more detail, we'll go through that in a minute. That can go up here out the way. That's that off. Obviously, I deal with these after when I clean everything up. It's all going to be taken off. Then you've got the pitch control. Again, the pitch control in the arm. You can see here the pitch has been, never been removed on this because it still has its own cable tie here. I can tell by looking at the, the solder pad points with the, to the solder on here and the way that the connections have been bent and with the pop-ups, this is original, it's never been used, never been you know, mistreated or replaced at any point. That's just too clean for it. This is also held on with two screws. You see there's a wire that goes from here to the arm. This is what I explained earlier. If you want to take the arm out of the deck, you can. So this is what we're going to do here. Top screw there. You do want to be very, very careful when putting these back together that you do not over tighten these screws. Trust me, you do not want to do that. There we go. Lovely stuff, right? There's your pitch control. The whole thing will come out together. Got the wiring harness. Potentiometer, that's what you use to calibrate the slider unit to the correct resistance. That's an original unit. There's the LED, as you can all see. The wires that go to the LED, anode and cathode, and you've got the connections there that are bent in there. 
but that's a fairly that's just a standard pitch control unit that's never been taken apart after rebuild that's an original slider unit I'll pop that up here for the time being as well torque specs i'm not giving anything not giving any torque specs this is just to genuinely help people out I have my own particular set that I'll put things to, but as you can see, removing them, they're not exactly the hardest of items to remove. And if you mimic that, tighten them back up, you're not going to run into any problems. Torque isn't necessarily an issue when it comes to that. With things that go inside the turntable, my advice is make sure they're nice and tight. Don't over tighten them. You can feel the biting point with a lot of this, but I'm not going to give any technical specs in that respect. If that's where you need to go with them, that's when you need to start thinking about giving turntables to to a technician to have repair work completed. Right, here we got Steve K. Good afternoon from, from Florida. Nice one, good to see you watching. Good afternoon to you as well. So these are the screws that go through for the tone arm. There's three screws here, and obviously the one screw that goes to the top of the plinth for the pitch control section. And as I stated before, you remove these screws, remove them, the arm assembly will come out of the plinth. With minimal effort usually, unless it's got something sticky underneath. Where they've been something's been spilt and there's your three screws for that they go here and like i said you literally this is this is why it's important to make sure that you have something underneath your arm and people use deck savers for these you'll undo that and it will go fud where it's hitting the top of the arm is hitting the top of the plastic the amount of people or techies that i see that do this or hobbyists do this it's not needed there we go and there we have one Technic's arm, the entire arm assembly. It's never been removed since it was made and put in there in the first place. We're going to wrap, which you're not going to wrap the cables. We're just going to put this round in such a way we can get this on the racking. Sorry for moving the camera, guys. Just, I just knocked that, haven't I? Um, right, that's that. The next section now is going to be the operation base. Now, remember I said to you about the tiny little screwdriver that was required. Now... Again, I have got one specific here that I can use if I want to, but I've actually got the points that with my tool, I can remove it. So give me a second. You spend the money and get the correct tools for the job. It makes your life a lot easier. I've seen people trying to use the wrong size and wondering why things are, are not working. This is also a big stress point on the turntable as well. If you get this wrong, you run into a world of pain. You've got the tiniest of little bolt here. Okay, so we're going to get that out of the way. Plastic covering that protects the switch. That can be reused if we want to as well. So we'll put that in here. We've now got a cable tie. So remember I told you that there's two cables or for three or four, two cables that physically hold on the switch. You've got the red, you've got the blue, and you've got the brown. What did I say? Did I said there was two cables. Sorry guys, there's not, there's three cables. I don't know what I told you that for. So be very careful when you remove that. You clip the cable. Free cable switch here, as you can see. That is your on-off switch. Okay. What you can do now, you've got four screws. Remove these screws here. So you've got one, two, three, and four. The entire operation base will lift out of the plinth. So we'll start with the middle one. We'll loosen these off. Then we will physically remove them. What tends to happen with a lot of these as well, if they've ever been thrown around or just they're you know, very, very old, or they start to get brittle because the entire operation base is made out of plastic. What tends to happen is they snap. So you'll find that certain turntables like this, if you're buying them secondhand, some of them can snap. It makes the buttons look like they're not at an even level because again, if, it's, if the mountain points are missing and there's nothing holding them in other than the middle or the edges, it's, gonna, it's not gonna be sitting properly and eventually it will drop down or just stay snapped inside the unit. So now there we go, there's the bolts or screws out of there. We'll move the start and stop switch out the way and carefully without scratching anything on that, we'll remove the operation base. And there it is, look, so it's an entire unit all in one. As you can see, 33, 45, start and stop, strobe surround. You've got a ball bearing underneath as well. That gives it the physical click noise against the switch. You've got the two tactile switches, the LEDs for the 33 and the 45, and obviously the other LEDs go through the wiring here, go straight through into another assembly, 
within the strobe housing with a diffuser sheet as well. Very important. Let's get that out of the way. That's that. Now, what I tend to do with this is shader cloths. Again, if you go onto DJ Spares, djspares.com, go through to the eBay store, Kevin DJ Spares stocks replacement trim, um, pitch felts. So you can buy them from there. You've got pitch trims as well. Obviously, these are fabric. You can buy self adhesive um, fabric sticks down on these. We're going to leave these on for the time being, so I like to remove these properly. But if you were going to strip down the turntable, ready to give it to someone to have it resprayed in the colour that you want, this video is very helpful for you because you can see now that's 99% basically of the deck removed on video. The next step now, we're going to take the main board out. We'll have a quick look at the spindle, power supply, fuse board assembly, transistor up here with the thermal paste. So. Let's do that first. Now, again, if you get this on your fingers, I'd highly recommend using gloves if you're going to do this. If you this touches your fingers, it's horrible. It's horrible stuff. This is why I wear gloves. A lot of people take the mickey out of me for wearing gloves, but look, I do this professionally. I'm not messing around with anything that can irritate your skin. You have to do it properly. So for this, I'm going to use, I've got another cloth here. Let's get the screws out of the way, make sure there's nothing on these. plate that goes over the top we'll pop that on here we are going to use some alcohol cleaner for this just to clean everything off there's no point in storing things away with everything else it's going to be dirty so we're going to clean this so we still got watching then hope no one's asleep or bored to, or bored rigid for watching me do this like i understand it's not the most entertaining of videos but this is what i do on a daily basis Obviously, my job is my well, my business is repairing, servicing, and customization of Technics turntables. This is what I do every day, every day, guys. Now think about that. I do this every day, stripping these things down. Ignore the alarm. That's just a building alarm. It's nothing to do with me. That's now nice and clean. Put that to one side. But yeah, this is an everyday task: stripping these down. Ugh, horrible. Right, let's get some more alcohol cleaner on this. Get this nice and clean. Very important as well, if you're going to do this, use a lint-free lint cloth. That way you're not going to have any rubbish or anything still flying around the turntable. That's the last thing you want. Trust me. Anything getting stuck. We just want it clean to a level that I can remove this without it sticking to anything else. I'm happy with that, just to get that off. Obviously the inside's going to all be cleaned out. We don't want to be pushing that back through. I get them when they use the wrong thermal grease or compound. Now what we've got to do now, we'll clean just loosely. In fact, no, we won't. We'll leave that until the board has been taken out. So we'll leave my alcohol cleaner solution just out of the way. We'll take the board out. First thing we're going to do now, so we've got the three bolts here that hold the physical motor in place, the brushless motor, and you've got three bolts here that hold the main board in. I need to change the screw over for this one here. It's the wrong size for that. So let's get them on the longer, the longer pitch. That's too shy. Um, let's try, actually, hang on a minute. Perfect. And that's going to be for the smaller, the smaller driver. So let's get that. Let's get that on it. There we go. Lovely. Choose a smaller screwdriver for this. Again, you haven't got to use too much force really to get these undone. They're quite long, there's three of them. Some of the ones that can be a little bit tight, persevere with it, use the right size tool. As you can see, I could have used the other tool to have undone that, but all that ends up happening is you end up scratching up the, the screwdriver heads on top and it just makes things look horrible. And if you're doing a proper job, you've got to do it properly, haven't you? And as you can see already here, Got loads of rubbish on my hands already on the gloves. This is why I wear gloves, this is why it's very important. Let's undo these again now. We use the other screwdriver for this because we know this is the other pitch size, which is correct. Fits in perfectly. So we've got one. Again, that's my alarm. That's not for an ear. Please ignore that. Sorry, guys. It's probably quite loud on the camera. Three. Here's the three bolts for that. That can go together with the three longer bolts. That now moves, as we can see. What I'm going to do now, while this is here, we've got, now I've got two screws. 
a hole on the fuse board itself. Depending on the amount of wiggle room we have with this, I either leave them on and get round them, or we lift that up carefully, pop that down carefully. We'll look at the spindle in just a second. Depending on the wiggle room of the cable, there's not really a lot there. Okay, let's see if we can get this with the bigger tool and get enough room just to manoeuvre it around. There we go. One, lovely, move the cable out the way until you've got the thread up on there. Two, beautiful. Now we get the fuse, the actual um, the fuse board unscrew, now we get the power supply. Two of the screws, will, the physical screws, will stay in rubber gaskets. Move around so I can actually see it. As you can see, the third screw, the closest one to the fuse board itself, will actually come completely out of the turntable. use it <laughs> lost his magnet again can't believe it can't you can't write this guy i tell you that's all right so we'll lift it out together it'll all come out anyway there we go now sometimes the rubber gasket doesn't want to move you can use a prime tool with this just to give it a little bit of a an ease there we go screw for that which came out as you can see is here we'll leave that alongside here so i know where that is and if we're careful we get this carefully there's the wire there as you can see with the switch the whole unit will come out. So that's the fuse board along with the power supply and the main board of the turntable. That's going to go on an anti-static bag. Which can go up here. There we go. Last thing to do on this now is, like I said, to clean off the, the thermal paste that's still on here. There might be a little bit of alcohol cleaner still left on this, but I'm going to actually put some more on. go without getting high as a kite just to get it started as you can see there's still there's quite a lot still on there it's quite thick happens with age on this sometimes you find that they comes off quite easily sometimes you find it doesn't sometimes you find it's minimal on it at all there was a pair i did finish off yesterday that literally had no near enough no thermal paste whatsoever just a deteriorator after age this is just to make sure that if I pick this up again, it's not going to cause me any grief. And obviously it's still on the board on the plinth, as you can see. We're going to get rid of that in just a second. Here's something else I use, which you're not going to be seeing. I'm not giving away all my tips, guys. It's pretty self-explanatory. Anybody can, anybody can take apart, you know, something. It's having the skill to complete the work. Put it back together without causing any problems. Now from a very, very young age, I was very notoriously known in my family for taking things apart, stripping them down to see how they work, and leaving them <laughs> when I couldn't get them back together. So from a, from a very young age, I used to work with electronics. That's a hell of a lot better than it was. And you can see there's still remnants and parts here, but this is just where the alcohols touch the main of the plinth. This is actually clean here. <laughs> <laughs> this is dirty. So there we go. That's that done. We'll get this out of the way now with the with my cloth that's covered in thermal paste. Give me a second. I can go over there. That can go back there. Right. There we go. You've now basically got a plinth stripped down of everything apart from the pitch trim. The pitch trim is a, literally a flexible sheet of aluminium that you can get underneath. Gradually lift it up. The whole thing will come off. Depending on condition of this, we we'll either clean this up or we replace it. I just check my notes I've got on the system, what the customer has actually asked for with this particular unit. Same thing goes for the surround, the plastic surround for the pop-up switch itself. That can be cleaned up. Everything will be cleaned up in there. Like I said, pitch shade, shade of felt, that's easy enough to replace as long as you remove all of the existing grime that's on them. You can buy shade of felts that go on slider units as well for the older units that can sit on the outside of the slider. All of the felt ties are all going to be removed. And that is how you get to a level that you can give this to a powder coater, a resprayer, and say, look, do this for me in this color. You can remove the center switch surround quite, quite easily as well for the pop-up. There's obviously going to be glue and remnants of glue around that. 
But all you do with that is just carefully removing some debonder around the plastic switch surround. That'll eventually just remove all of the godules that are there and you take the switch off. Very straightforward to do. If you can get to that level and you can give this to somebody to respray or powder coat, you're already 90% where you need it to be. And like I said, if you then watch this video back in reverse on how I've done this, putting things back together, as long as you've got thermal paste, obviously that's very important. Otherwise you're gonna be in for a world of pain again and you're gonna be calling me or other people up, other technicians going, I've just done this, but got no thermal paste on it and it's gone bang. You know, it doesn't wanna turn on, blah, 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 blah. Lots of different things that can happen. So make sure thermal paste, put things back how they are once you've done it. Very important things to bear in mind if you are gonna give this to somebody to respray or mainly this is to do with people with powder coat. You see all these threads that I had to take all the bolts and screws out of, make sure that you put your bolts back in them, okay? If you've got a load of old bolts, ideally old bolts, if you've got old bolts that you can put back in that you're not too fussed about throwing them back in the bin afterwards, put them in, cap everything over. Because if you don't do that, Believe you me, trying to screw down new screws into recoated areas and recoated threads is not the one. <laughs> it is not the one. And that is talking from experience many moons back when I used to do this with powder coating. I tend to stay well clear of powder coating now. Same thing goes around all of the weak areas, things where the pitch, pitch trim sits, for an example. If they put too much powder on and they coat it too much and they go a bit over the top and the person that's doing the work is a bit overzealous with the coat, you'll find that your trim won't go in straight. Surround won't go in straight. Plastic operation base won't go back in. You have to end up trying to dremel things round, sand things down lightly. It's not worth the problem. So respraying is a safer bet. And obviously vinyl wrapping. Like I've explained so many times, that's obviously what I offer is vinyl wrapping. Vinyl wrapping, you can remove it if you don't want to remove your original graphics underneath. You can remove it whenever you want, put it back to its original state of causing minimal damage to air corners and things if there's any corrosion. Um, you know, it's a safer, cheaper option to go for, or you buy a replacement plinth. So this is the same thing. You could buy a replacement brand new plinth, get them imported, they're bloody expensive, but you can do this. And that's how, guys, you get to that point. Now what I'm gonna show you, because we haven't finished yet, let's get this out of the way. Let's pop it over here. I'm gonna show you another little trick in a second. Oh yeah, 20 past six, got plenty of time. So what we'll do now, if I just angle, see if I can angle this without having to move things. Hang on a minute. Take your gloves off because they've got all the further paste on them. Oh, we've still got watching then. Let's quickly click on the comments, see if anyone's on there. All chats, really good video. Any ball bearing lovers out there? <laughs> Right, I'll show you a few other bits on here, shall we? So I haven't finished yet, there's a few tips I wanna show you. For those of you that have audio related problems, you might wanna watch this video. Let's get another pair of gloves on, give me a second. One thing I do wanna say very quickly to those that are watching, or people that are watching this later on during the, the night, the evening, etc. I get the odd comment here and there saying that I can't, I don't accept criticism, right? <laughs> or I can't, I can't handle the heat someone said to me yesterday. You further from the truth, I can, it's ridiculous now. The problem that people have with me is, I, I'm brutally honest. I'm brutally honest with things. And if you don't accept my opinion, that's fine. Everyone's got their own right to their opinion. But just because you think something's right does not mean that you are right. And if I've, if I've been doing this for a living for over 10 years, and this is something that I do, and obviously I, the amount of people that I speak to, and obviously engineers, etc., that I speak to, as well as a service manual that backs me up with what I say, for you to say that I'm wrong when I have the information in front of me stating that I am correct, you've got no argument. So for people to say that I can't accept criticism, well, I can. I just don't like dealing with people that think they're know-it-alls that actually don't know what they're doing. Sorry, that's just me. And what I tend to do now is just ignore messages or just ban and block the people that are going to cause me problems. Why would I want to deal with it? It makes my life easier. Make your life stress-free, not harder. Work smarter and not harder. Right, so the main bearing itself, this is the central bearing of the unit. 
held on with the three screws. If I can move my, my lamp over here, my little lamp, just so I can show you. What you've got with a lot of these turntables over, over years, you tend to find the older units have a completely different assembly on the bottom. There's a plastic, plastic section that sits on the bottom. You have to remove the areas on the bottom to pull the spindle up through the housing. You've got to be very careful. This is an E-clip on this unit. You probably can't see it properly without it being under light, but there's an E-clip in there, as you can see it there, look. Once you remove the thrust plate, yep, yeah, I said it, thrust plate, that's what it's called. Once you remove the thrust plate, you take the E-clip out, gently pull that round and up, and the whole spindle comes off. You can then clean this, polish the brass, I do it with all of them, machine polish everything, polish the assembly, deep clean the housing, deep clean the inner section of the bearing itself, because it is classed as a bearing, a bearing from tube, and put it back together with some fresh Adderall oil, and that is what you do. You can buy replacement thrust plates as well, guys. Now, thrust plates are available from DJ Spares. I'm not sponsored in any way by them, but I use DJ Spares weekly uh, for certain parts that have been remanufactured. Top quality gear as always. That's what you use with this. Uh, DJ Works, Origins, I'm like assholes. Everyone's got one. <laughs> I just saw briefly saw some of that, whoever commented that, but you're absolutely right. Right, so there's that. Okay, pitch the pitch control. This is what I'm going to also tell you while I've got you on here as well. Let's get this out of the out of the frame completely. It's annoying, isn't it? Let me show you using a very basic, cheap multimeter some of the things that you can do, which are going to help you out. Quickly grab it. While we're at it, let's grab your disposable vape as well, shall we? Yes, I'm a vapor. I have to vape. I had uh, pneumonia many years ago. I scarred my lungs. I couldn't smoke after that, so. Yep, stop vaping, which doesn't really bother me, it's cheaper. Right, cheap basic multimeter. Okay, now you're going to need something a bit more substantial if you're going to be doing troubleshooting work on turntables, 100%. But what I tend to use the cheaper ones for is continuity mode, as well as using obviously just basic troubleshooting, just to show you, like on this video for an example. Now, calibrating the slider unit. Bearing in mind, this has never been taken out of the deck. There is a way of doing this as well without taking this out of the deck just to check the actual calibration settings of the slider, which I'm not gonna show you, but this is this is all over the web. You can find this anywhere, so I'm not giving away any secrets for those that are going, oh, here we go. Red and brown connection you've got on here. Red and black probe, pop it over the top. I actually use crocodile clips with what I've got with the better ones. Now this particular slider unit, I hold this steady, there's a couple of recessed points. I hate using standard probes. I tend to use crocodile connections with thinner connections or expandable connections. That's set of just over 3K. It's bouncing between three and 0 0.1. That could just be the multimeter, but this is a basic multimeter just for basic testing. So the idea now, that's originally set at three. You can move your screwdriver in here and you'll see when I move the potentiometer, but it moves up and down the range. So the idea with this, with a lot of these slider units, is set them at 2.70. Now, with this multimeter in particular being a basic multimeter, you're not gonna get absolute perfection. As you can see now, it's bouncing around. I actually have a bench power supply. I've got a bench multimeter that I have here, a physical bench one. And I also have a, um, a higher quality handheld unit as well. Not unit as in this, but physical handheld unit multimeter. This is just to just produce really with, um, with continuity between audio cables. So I just thought I'd show you this. 2.70 is the recommended or the dedicated setting for Mark II units within the service manual. The problem that people don't realize is that service manual was in, from the 70s and it was never changed until the M3D and the Mark V. So you will find now if you buy, if you're lucky enough to buy an entire assembly for a Mark II, or even for M3D and Mark V, you'll find that the Mark II assemblies are actually calibrated at 2.9K. So they're preset at 2.9K, and the idea is you simply just pop this in your deck, you connect it up, use a frequency counter or frequency monitor um, to set the mainboard potentiometer to the correct position, which is 262.08. You set that, that calibrates the zero point. So basically on a Mark II, you set that to 262.08 on the main board with your frequency monitor or frequency counter, 
Um, this you set to 2.70, but depending on the age of your turntables and what systems you're using, that can vary. Okay, it can vary, and people don't realize this. Never mind all this set it to 2.70 and leave it. That's not entirely true. The service manual was never updated until the M3D and the Mark V because the M3D and the Mark V being a different style of unit didn't have the lock in the middle. OK, and the idea with that unit was you'd set that to 2.875. Right. Once that's done, 262.08 then sets to zero percentage, because if you didn't set the, the frequency counter on the main board this correctly, you find your zero point could either be up or down, depending on how high or low the setting is on your main board. So it's very important that you do that. So in other words, these units, if you've got an older Technics model, either with the three prong connectors at the back for the pitch or just the earlier late to eight, nine, 80s to 90s turntables, you'll find that they're set to 2.70. This was a 3K from new. They weren't all set to 2.70 from factory. Do you see where I'm coming from here, guys? So the service manual might tell you 2.7, but this unit was never touched. That potentiometer doesn't change, okay? It's set in one situation. I could leave that at 3K, that will stay there. Over periods of time of wear or use, if things go in here, that may start to change. But in reality, it doesn't, right? So where I'm getting at is, that was set at 3K from factory. A lot of these units I get are also set after 3K. Some of them can be just under, but that's 3K. So when you're buying new slider units, fresh in their box, genuine dash two new units, there'll be 2.9K. It's closer to three than it is 2.70. Aftermarket units, third party sliders that I use regularly, all set at 2.70. That's it, 2.7K, that is it. That's what you set them as. Our genuine units can range between 2.7, 8.75, 2.9 over three. You need to judge that and work with it yourself. It's not one fixed you know, one fixed setting with genuine units, no matter what anybody tells you, okay? M3Ds, Mark Vs, obviously they're set differently. M5G, Mark VI, both use the same slider units. They are literally just turn it to full gain and away you go, right? But these are a different ball game altogether. So genuine unit, this was set to 3K from factory, not 2.70. But that, with the basic multimeter, is how you check and can calibrate the slider. Obviously, you can strip them down. You can change the unit over. It's not a particularly hard thing to do. It's time consuming. You've got to make sure you do it correctly. Checking the wiring harness to make sure that, like for this, for an example, you can see the main points across the top. They can get bent. Make sure that they're not physically loose and about to snap. This has to be changed or stripped down. Um, that's how you check that. Audio related issues. We're going to show you this one quickly. Let's just show you this with a cloth. If I put a cloth down, I wouldn't normally do this with just a cloth, but I'm going to show you this. Oh, don't just knock the camera. Sorry, guys. Hang on a second. Right. Let's put my cloth on here. Not bothered about it being too pristine clean because obviously the, <laughs> the deck needs a bloody good clean anyway. But the arm assembly, if we get this here, and we unwrap the cable out from the deck. Okay. Here's another thing as well, just to sort of put this at end as well. The cable on this is an original cable, all right? Original cable. End connectors on this have been replaced. But you'll see the length of the grounding cable. This is a genuine grounding cable. The length of the cable when I flatten this all out is actually further. Now what tends to happen is they're either the same size, slightly longer, they're never shorter. You never find them a quarter of the size shorter. A lot of aftermarket cables that you find that are classed as genuine Panasonic cables, they are Panasonic grounding cables, yes, but not from this unit. That's why you find some of them that have grounding cables. When you actually put them out, they're about the same size as this on the cable. They're not all the way to the end and they're much shorter. That is why. Now, what I'm getting at with this, where this cheap multimeter can come in handy, if you've got one that actually has physical noise detection that outputs a sound, if you put it in continuity mode and you set it to one side, when you've got customers or you've got 
a turntable that you've just bought that has a physical audio issue and you get problems where you know oh the audio is not coming through on one channel correctly or you find that it's intermittent and you try doing the usual you unscrew it you want it back through you tighten it back up you'll see on the ends of the arm as you can see in there let me make it out on the camera without it being there's four points within that arm they're spring-loaded connections what you've got is put this in simple terms for people that don't understand this you've basically got the ends of each cable or each wire so you've got the red and the white okay the end of the red cable which is the main point of the red cable top right the white cable main point at the top top left the outer sides of the cable on either side is left and right that matches the particular orientation of the cable. So what you can do is use continuity mode. Not only if the arm is actually physically stripped apart, you can go between one point, hang on, one point at the end to the insides of the arm to check the continuity of the cable. So basically making sure there's no breaks in the cable. You can push it, it's got constant noise, you can move the cable. I wouldn't do this if I'm checking the cables, I'd just do that to check the main continuity between the ends of the socket to this. If I'm using the cheap multimeter to do so, I put my crocodile style clips on the ends. But where I'm getting at is if I was gonna do the red connector, which is, which is obviously the right connector, if we're using the main point, which would be red, and we push this up, and if I look at the arm, moving this in, get this to the top right hand corner, you can hear it beeping, right? So we've got a clean connection there. Now, if we go to the bottom connection on the bottom right, and we go onto the outer section of the cable, of the connector, that should beep as well. There we go. Now, if I go between the top and the bottom, there's nothing on the top, which is because it's on the outer side. That's correct. So we know that the red, or the right-hand side cable, has good connection. So you shouldn't have any issues of audio from that particular side. And this, obviously I'll explain this in a second, but it goes from the end of the cable. So I'll do the same thing now with the left-hand side. I know this is a bit of a weird way of doing this, and I usually use crocodiles, but I need to, just for demonstration on this. Top main point of the cable. Right, that's breaking off slightly. Right, we have got connection, but the pins actually are slightly dirty on that side. That can cause the problem. So then I'll hold that down, use the altar sleeve. Bottom left, perfect. So there is probably, I know the customer is reporting issues with the audio, that is more than likely what it's gonna be. The push prong connections are a little bit grubby. They need to be cleaned. Now, where I was getting at with using the probes to do this with a cheap multimeter, for the sake of spending five quid or whatever it was years ago for that, just changing the battery ever so often, you can check from the end of your arm to the end of the connector cable. None of this having to strip things down, check the brakes first of all. You can go from the end of the cable, end of your arm to the end of the cable. So literally from one end to the other. If you find like I've just found that you've got, we've got a multimeter that can tell you when there's brakes and the noise and things. Um, if you have that happen, check the connection inside, check for brakes in the cable, check for overling on the cables. Original cables were renowned for this, obviously these being an aftermarket jobby, they're not really got that problem, but you'll find that the original cables would over, you have to move them, they get all crackly and horrible, sleevens are cheap, that's part of the problem. So check the continuity, check the connection, buy a cheap multimeter. If you have, if you bought a set second hand and you're experiencing audio problems, you haven't got to take the arm out to do this, you just simply get both cables, and go just do exactly what I've said there. Top right is red, and that's the main point. Bottom right is the outer. Top left, main point for white. Bottom left, outer side of the connection. So you can check to make sure that there's no breaks in the cable or problems with the connection. Also make sure while you've got the, the prong on there like I was doing, going between top and bottom, make sure that there's no you know, no um, open circuit between the two, basically, right? So you're not got the two connections joined together or someone sold them badly. Um, you could also check from the inside of the, the arm spring-loaded connections to the physical color-coded connection cables that are inside the arm that go to the PCB. 
You can do that by tracing the wires down, going on the PCB and doing that as well. I tend to check the arm, I'll check the board itself, the PCB, and I will check the cable. It's common sense with this. If you miss one thing, you're gonna end up ruining the entire thing, having to strip it all down again and work from scratch. But that is how you check if you were gonna buy a set second hand, checking the actual audio output. If someone sells you a pair and they say they've got audio issues, that's gonna come in very handy for you. Right, so pop-ups. Again, very, very simple. You've literally got a push spring, is push spring there, push that little spring down. There's another large spring that goes in. There's a plate with an E-clip underneath. That's what holds the whole thing together there. You've got a screw that holds in the, the rod that physically connects underneath the switch. And that's spring loaded. You could take the entire housing off for the pop-up with a tiny little Phillips screwdriver, electronics toolkit. It all comes off and your wires, as you can see, one goes down to positive that goes to the board and the other one goes down to the actual bottom part of the switch with the, inline, with the resistor in line of the switch. These are a lamp, a standard. Mark V's obviously had LEDs and onwards had LEDs, but the originals had lamps. A lot of people prefer using original lamps. It's entirely up to you. Just bear in mind that they can blow and they do blow. So my honest opinion on that is to do what I do with everybody else here. That is cut the connections and rewire in SMDs. And an SMD is a surface mounted diode. It is an LED basically that's flat panel that goes in. It's custom made that I put inside the unit. And that's the pop-up assembly. Operation base, like I was just saying about earlier as well. So the buttons are made out of plastic. You've got the stem here that goes through for the start and stop that you can see moving up and down. It's held on by an E-clip. You can take that out. You can clean that through. You can re-oil it if you wish. Same thing goes to the 33 and the 45. There's no E-clips with these. Depending on the age, this one here is going to have two flexible sheets of rings of plastic that you then pull off the switches. They fly across the room if you're not careful. And then you just take the main switches off. You can change your tactile switches over. Start and stop assembly isn't as simple as you think it would be. You have to be very careful when taking that out or you can break the plastic screen if you're going to take the strobe off. But there's four LEDs in here. And that's the start of the operation base of start and stop assembly, as a lot of people call it. And that's basically that. That is that, guys. Is that. There's not really much more that I can explain about this, really. Um, let me quickly turn the camera around in a second. Hang on a minute. Put my multimeter out of the way. Let me just quickly grab that off the stand. Let me see if I can put this in such a way that it's going to stand, ideally stand up. Who we still got watching? Who's still with me? Let's lower my chair down. There we go. Who's still with us then? Now what I'm going to try and do now is go for a few of these comments. I know there's quite a lot of them here, but if anyone's got any questions, now is the time to ask. I'm about to have this for an hour and 37 minutes. Uh, live chat. Are Neo IID cables a good upgrade for standard ones? I actually, we, I used to sell them. Um, they're good cables, yeah. I mean, look, an audio cable, as long as it's oxygen free, it's got good shielding on there, um, you know, then you're already in for a good start. But to be fair, you're overspending on something that you really don't need to. A lot of people tend to put plates on the bottom of their deck so they can then have, you know, removable cables and pop whatever you want to have on there instead. Isn't, I mean, you've got to be very careful. I used to find a lot of Van Damme cables used to be a bit temperamental with audio in the respects of the audio quality. You'd lose some of the highs. Um, so your Iowa Day cables, I used to call them, are very, very good. Don't get me wrong. But for turntables, you don't really need to use them. Um, you don't need to use them. Oh, come on. Look at the bloody chat keeps vanishing. This is so annoying. DJ works. What's this? To quote Dirty Harry, opinions are like assholes. Everyone's got one. I would add some are clean and well maintained. Others stink. <laughs> Ryan, thank you, mate. Really good video. Thank you, mate. Def creator. Any ball bearing lovers out there? Right, okay. Jock, laugh out loud. It is. Senfil or Sentil watching this is therapeutic. Oh, mate. Not every day, trust me, doing this every day is not therapeutic. It's the most painstaking task you can think of, but it is literally the dream job, let's be honest. Uh, in the hands of the master. Thank you, Mike. How are you doing, bud? You all right? Good to see you watching. Steve K, good afternoon from Florida. Good afternoon to you too. Jock, talk seconds. I'm not telling you that. 
Uh, Javier Dario, good. Jock, I'm really enjoying this. Thank you. You're very welcome. Jock, can you install a plus and minus 16 digital pitch in a Mark II? Nope, not unless you're going to do the ultra pitch mod. And I wouldn't recommend going over plus and minus eight on the standard pitch. You can adjust the range slightly, but you're going to ruin the original feel. And the original pitch is not going to be as accurate. Uh, there's a difference between a screw and a bolt. Yes, I'm fucking fully aware of that. Thank you very much, Jock. <laughs> Screw you, screw in, and bolts the bolt. Oh, fuck out. Sean, how you doing, bud? Dr. Woodrow's operating theatre. Yeah. It's Joseph Fritzel's love dungeon. Right, thanks for your installed the Backtracks Ultra Pitch mod. That's what I was just going on about. Uh, Ryan had to take mine to Jay to fix some bodge monkeys work with fake genuine dash two faders. No comment there, Ryan, but I'm glad I could get it sorted for you. Trips, 100%, Ryan. Jay is the best man for Technics in the UK, hands down. Thank you very much. This man really is Technixologist. 100% hi, Jason. How you doing, Trips? Thank you, mate. Out to Noof. Good day from Tanzania. Nice one. From Tanzania. John G, cheers from Canada. Mike, much respect to what you do and keeping these techniques running for the next few decades or more. I know you don't do much mods, but what are your thoughts on doing a removable power cord? It's up to you. I mean, look, you're not gonna you're not gonna affect anything. It's not gonna devalue it as long as you do it properly or give it to somebody that can do the work correctly. Don't get scared off by people that say you're gonna devalue them. It makes no difference, guys. A 1210 is a 1210, 1200 is a 1200. As long as you add that you've had the work completed, it's fine. It's just gonna mean that you've got a physical cable you have to plug in. I prefer, if I'm gonna do something like that, physically installing terminals, screw-based terminals, that you can strip the cable down and pop it inside the deck. That I'd much prefer than having something that can just fall out of the back of the turntable. Um, but that's my honest opinion. Plus, you're going to be putting stress on the cable unless you're using an L-section bend cable. Uh, but that's just me being o OCD. Uh, DJ for real. I'm a bedroom DJ six months in. I know nothing. Love these channels. Thank you. You're very welcome, mate. You'll get there. You'll get there, mate. Open. Uh, you should use a negative range, though. There are some tips I can tell you, but I won't get started on that. I can't believe people are buying Mark 7s where these beauties are out there. Well, I do. If you're on about mixing with the negative range, I do, but very rarely. I mean, all of my, you know, I mean, I mix hard techno and shrans. I mean, an acid techno mainly is what I get booked to play. So I'm always in the plus. There's no way of being out of negative. If you start slowing the tracks down, all the guys that are enjoying your music at 150 BPM are all going to start slowing down. They're going to go to the bar. They're going to start going out for a fag. Do you know what I mean? It's just, nah, I don't use minute. I don't use the minus. Noofy, I've got ST150s too. Matthew, YouTube lives are much better as I don't use Facebook much. Fair play, we'll see a lot more of these videos on YouTube. Sean, afternoon, or just an Audi, get him a bottle of brandy. I hope you bought a screwdriver set, mate, and uh, some sort of portable sander because you can buy any sorts of rubbish in there. I went in there once for, well, yeah, I went in there once for a pint of milk with the missus and walked out there of a turntable that like I gave away as a competition prize. That's what happens. I went with the straight 150s for the reason. Let's check it out. That's all. We're up to date with the comments. Anything new? Ah, here we go. Some more comments coming through here. What have we got? BMX adds AF. Brilliant, Jay. Cheers. Thank you, mate. Sean, great stream, Jay. Uh, the Shizzle 17. Can a tone arm that is bent down be straightened? No. You've got to think of it like this. Any way really of bending that back is going to be by using heat. And you they've already been treated and made into that shape. The minute you add heat and bend them back, they're going to crack. There's no, once they're bent and broken, it's game over for them. Change them out, change the arm, change the tube. Try towns DJ Kiss. Great work. I watch your channel for tips all the time. Thank you very much. RC, our new pitch control units you can get as good as the originals. Right, okay. You'll find that the curvature of the slider between 0 and 3.3 .3 is steeper. Okay, but once you get past the 3.3 .3 range, they are very, very smooth. I personally don't struggle with aftermarket units. You'll find they're all roughly modelled around each other. I strictly use DJ Spare sliders and 1200s.com sliders. They are by far, in my opinion, the best. They have a softer click at 0, so the ball bearing and spring click is softer. So if you're mixing around the zero point, it's not going to be as bad. No physical harsh knock when you move it in. Um, and plus, it slows down a lot quicker before you get to the zero point. So it depends on your style. But everybody I put these in, 
very, very rare that I get anyone turn around and say that they have problems. There is the odd person out there that just can't get on with them at all. Um, but is the real stark reality is there are there's no such thing as genuine sliders now here in the UK. You, I cannot import them. There is no way of getting them. No one sells genuine, no matter what you hear. And I can, I'll be blatantly honest on that. There is no such thing as brand new box genuine sliders here in the UK. And if you're lucky enough to find a technician or somebody that has them stockpiled and they are genuine Panasonic units. Everything else is not made by Panasonic, not made by Alps even for Panasonic. So the ones you find now that say they're genuine, they are no different to the aftermarket sliders that you can buy anywhere else and pretty much do the same thing. But in my opinion, DJ Spares, 1200s.com, get them from there. Absolutely wicked. But it's up to you whether you get on with them. I, I get on with them absolutely fine. Eric, can pitch range be adjusted so the next red dot stands still at 3.3 or 4? Right, this is what I'm saying. Now, you will find that some genuine turn times, I get this all the time, genuine units that have been used as hi-fi decks, you'll find that some of them can be over 4 and the plus 6 will be 6.4, depending on the calibration settings. You'll find some of them will be 2.5 near 3 instead of 3.3. The pitch trim is a stick-on trim. It's a guide, Okay. They don't actually match properly. And depending on where you um, set your calibration settings up, if you're using a newer slider, you change the calibration settings, you should be having 6.4 pitch with genuine. Aftermarket, you're going to have plus 6, just before, just over. And 3.3 is around 2.5, nearly 3, on plus and minus. So you're going to get a genuine range between 2.5 on both sides of the pitch and plus 6, near enough where it should be. Um, but the answer, quite simply, is no. There is no way of getting every single strobe dot exactly as it is. It is luck of the draw. I've got one in here at the moment, which is actually ironically the one that I'm selling. The pitch on that is perfect. Absolutely perfect. You've got 6.4, 3.3 plus, and 3.3 minus. It is one of the nicest decks you're going to find to mix on. Anyway, there's once one, by the way. 700 quid, wrapped, looks gorgeous. More details on the Facebook page for that one. So if you're in the UK and fancy a really nice refurbished Technics that I've completed myself with 1200s.com audio cables, keep your eyes peeled on the page. It is still available. Lots of questions coming in for it, but no one is committing as of yet. Uh, that's that one there. Eric, uh, Mike, thank you. Aris Music, excellent live. Jay, greetings from Italy. Good. Thank you for watching. I was in Italy just over a month ago with the missus. Uh, Italy, love it. More chats coming through. What else have we got? Sean, I'm not open the brandy yet, and you're a legend. And there's no one else I'd give my 1210s to apart from you. Thank you, mate. Tones, really love your channel and work. So what do you do with a stuck height adjustment? Right, like I said earlier on in the video when I was taking the arm apart, your best friends with a stuck height adjustment, if you're not going to rebuild it and you just want to get it so that it works and you can reset it at zero, is penetrant oil. There's lots of different types that you can use. I tend to stick away from that because I stripped the arm down completely and I have my own ways of getting them loosened up. But if you're at home and you want to put something in there to get it moving again, you need to spray it over all of the threads, wipe away any excess. You don't want to get it anywhere else and let it set. Don't just start moving it around. I'll simply will try and use grips on them and churn into the plastic on the high adjuster rings. Don't do it. You don't need to do any of that. Just spray penetrant oil in it and leave it. WD-40, ironically, do a range of penetrant oil. Um, they actually do a penetrant oil, WD-40, do the brand themselves. It's pretty good. Again, make sure you use a fresh cloth with it, one that you can dispose of after you've used it. Just spray it in, work it in all around the excess, wipe off the excess of it, leave it, let it set, and start to slowly manipulate it. Grip the base, grip the top of the arm and move it around until eventually it will start to free itself. Sometimes it won't work at all. Sometimes they are so beyond the point of being able to spray penetrant oil in there that they just will not move. And if that is the case, you need to strip it down and clean it. Now I've shown you how to take the arm out of the deck. There are plenty of videos online that you can see on how to strip the arm down. Personally, in my opinion, you should be sending it off to a technician if it's really that bad. If you're happy with how it is, if it's set, say, for an example, at zero, between zero and two, you know, it's a good balance between the two where you can level out the arm, then you're fine. Unless you're really OCD with this and you really want to get it perfect, then send it off to a technician. 
There's plenty of us out there. There's a few very good technicians out there. If you're in the UK, like I've said, you've got myself, obviously. You've got DJ Spares. You've then got Pimp My Decks. Again, great people. Out of the UK, again, you want to be checking out 1200s.com, especially if you're in the States. Absolutely awesome. Christian's a lovely guy. He'll help you out. He'll sort you out straight away, as long as he can fit you in. Everyone's fully booked. I'm fully booked until April. Uh, so you're going to be very, very... Out of luck if you're trying to get things done quickly. Uh, D says Shizzle, thanks for clarifying. What height do you set your tone arm at just out of curiosity? Or what would you recommend for scratch DJs? Right, okay. So, again, uh, the main thing with this is setting your anti-skate at zero. Everyone's under their own illusion that the anti-skate should be set at the same as what the grams of the turntable are. So if you set your weight at three, your anti-skate should be at three, right? If you're playing back records for hi-fi use, yes. For DJs, if you are scratching and cueing records, the last thing that you want is for any pressure or resistance going against the arm, going back to the rest, okay? My opinion with this, and this is what I do for every customer, your anti-skate should be set at zero. If you watch any top scratch DJ, Hubert for an example, anti-skate at zero, his height is up higher. When the arm is up higher, the arm's dropping down more. There's more weight going onto your stylus. But the problem with doing that is you're going to end up wearing off your stylus quicker. It's going to cause more weight going onto the stylus. It's going to embed it more. You're going to eventually wear out your records as much as the myth it is. It does happen, but it takes a long time to do so. Um, so my honest opinion with that, like I've just said, set the weight where it needs to be. To find out if you're using autophones, for an example, if you're using shores, or you're using separate head shells, Set the gram of the weight of what it tells you in your manual. When you bought your carts, it will be in there. Make sure you do that. Go online, go on the Shure website, go on to Autophon's website. It will tell you on there what to set the gram weight of the back of your arm. Do that. Anti-skate at zero. Number one thing to do. Set it at zero. Now, with my Mark 7s at home, because obviously I still have the Mark 7s sitting at home from the reviews, I would personally, like my turntable was just over two and a half, I think it is on the height adjustment. The idea is to stand on the side, stand at the side of the turntable, and instead of having the arm so it's at a level like this, you want to have it so it's near enough straight. Once you've got that right, especially with new turntables, you can pretty much match it with the other. And as long as there's no damage in transit or things machining slightly off, you can pretty much get them the same. But I'd, I'd have them, so you have to have it so that the arm is straight. So when you're looking at it, it's like that. Simple as that. Simple as that. Uh, for mixing only, zero anti-skate, yes. Yes, zero anti-skate. Another argument with this as well. DJs that use Stanton Straight 150s or any DJs that use arms other than Technics arms, right, on their, on their Technics, argue the toss about this and say about anti-skate and how do you set it because there's no anti-skate. There's no anti-skate on a straight tone arm. Right. If you're buying straight 150s, you'll notice that the anti-skate cap is not nothing on it. It will move, but there's nothing inside it. Right. You don't need anti-skate with straight arms. So if you think there's no anti-skate on there and these arms were designed for people that could scratch for heavy queuing, there's no anti-skate. You don't use anti-skate when you DJ. I don't care what anybody says. There's no anti-skate on straight 150s, ST1, uh, straight 100s. Um, there's loads of them out there with straight arms. Rest Vestax, all of this stuff. Set your anti-skate on zero. Scratch DJs have them on zero. You don't want any friction, any resistance going back to the arm. All of mine I ever leave here are all set to zero. It's up to you to decide what you want to have. Me, it's a zero. Simple as that. Everything that leaves is set to zero. You do what you want with them. More of my recommendations, anti-skate at zero. Level up the arm. Depends on the condition of your arms. All of these decks that I get in here can have various different damage to arm assemblies, tubes that could be slightly bent, might be a slight kink. If they still work and you're happy, then great. But personally, you should spend the money and buying new arms. But yeah, that's my take on, on setting up the arm assembly. Make sure it's straight, zero anti-skate, and level up the arm. Uh, where can I book them in? Yeah, check the website, hang on. Um, I'd really like to send you my two 1200 Limiteds, but, well, I'm in Germany. Yeah, <laughs> you ain't getting them over here, mate. Unfortunately, I used to I used to service turntables for all over the world. That's no that's no rubbish. I genuinely did. And it wasn't until just, just after COVID kicked in that I stopped offering it. 
Um, I used to import turntables all the time from Japan. And then my contacts over in Japan ceased trading because of COVID. They never reappeared. Uh, it was a real big shame. But I used to import things all the time from Japan. Um, I used to deal with customers worldwide. Courier costs got too expensive. People don't want to pay the money. And the bigger problem that you have is if you do run into the unfortunate issue that you have any problems with turntables. Say, for an example, you have a set of decks done. You get the service work completed. You have pop-ups installed. What happens if you get them thrown around in transit all the way back? You get them back and um, and your lamp stops working. You know, the LED blows or the connection's been dislodged or something in transit and something breaks. And it's a simple job for me to fix, but you don't know anybody local that can do it. You've got to send it back again. I've got to pay the costs. I have to, I have to pay, the, pay the, the, main, you know, the main cost to get it back to repair an item that's not expensive for you to have done in the first place to send it back again. It's expensive and it's not worth the aggro now. Now the courier costs have gone up and um, commercial invoicing and things like that. It's just not worth my time to do it. So unfortunately for the minute, until things, and if things change, UK is my main thing. I have people fly over here. I actually had people fly over here. They used to fly to the airport and get a taxi to here when I used to have my old modern, my old, my old modern office about five, four or five years ago. They used to go down there Get an, used to get a plane from where they were, get a taxi, straight here, all tanned, freezing their nuts off in the no November or it's winter over here, and uh, dropping their turntables off. Crazy. And the amount of them used to turn up damaged where they never used to pay for the insurance, it was secure and properly in flight cases. It was insane. And they'd stay here for a few days, get work completed, visit family or with anything over here, what some people did as well. Stay here for a few days, go somewhere else on holiday, take their decks with them. Got a very good customer of mine called Zax. I mean, he's he's abroad as well. Had his blue decks done. He's happy as Larry. But again, I don't tend to deal with people abroad purely for the fact of if you run into any problems during transit, you got to get it back, and it's expensive to get things sorted. Uh, tones top priority on scratching is not where. <laughs> yeah, look, I get that because I'm also a scratch DJ. I learned how to scratch before I could mix. I'm just stating the obvious. Okay that if you cherish your records, you wouldn't believe the amount of DJs that I speak to that are so OCD with cleaning their scratch records and worried about and wearing because they think they've got too much weight on them. Look, I have, but if my main scratch records, like Super Seal Breaks, that sort of thing, they might be skip proof and they do wear over periods of time. In one of my, what was it, Weapons of Mass Destruction volume vinyls that I have, was so heavily worn over the first quarter of the record from the, the R and Fresh samples I used to use re religiously over every set I used to play. That, you know, doesn't matter how much alcohol adhesive or anything you're using to clean your records, that's not going to get any better. But I do get customers that come in that are really, really bothered about weight issues, about scratching their records and wear and tear. It's insane. I totally get your point because I'm exactly the same field as you. If you're that bothered about it, buy two copies. I have two copies of all of my scratch records. I've got about six or seven that I use. Mainly, it's just the R and Fresh, right? But I want to make sure that I've got other samples that I can work with. And I can now with, now with the beauty of using DVS or using Phase, you can have whatever you want on, can't you? Throw it through the mixer. And uh, you haven't got to buy any records. You know, get wear problems anymore. Totally get your point. Uh, I'm with you 100%. Uh, Matthew, check the website. What's that for? Is this asking about... Yeah, where can I book in my decks with you? Yep, check the website. So justtechnics.co.uk, UK-based customers only, I'm afraid. So if you're in the UK, then brilliant. Um, you won't be able to book in me until April. What is my nearest available slots now is April. Uh, what else have we got here? I hate that the chat keeps on vanishing. RC, a question about the quartz lock. Does it only work at zero or across the entire range? Now, okay, everybody asked me this question. If you look at any of the manuals that when you buy your Technics, it's, it says on there, it's continuous through the range. I was under the impression that originally when I used to work on these many moons back, it was just the 0% lock. But think of it logically, right? That break in the board, it's a break in the board, is the lock. So when the ball bearing goes over that, it locks it in place. So it locks it at a constant 0%. Now, if you imagine with the M3D, for an example... On the Mark V, are you telling me because the lock's not there, 
it's not locked through the whole range. So when you have it at zero about using the switch, are you telling me that it's got quartz locked? No, it's throughout the entire range. That's my take on that. If anyone knows any different or think any different, chime up and tell me. That's my opinion on the quartz lock. Uh, Mike, use your quality video, mate. Take heed of this man's words. He knows his stuff. Got to go, Jay. The cats are hungry. All right, Mike. Nice one, mate. Cheers for watching. The shizzle. Thanks, mate. Back to my original question with the bent arm. Would I need a whole new arm tube or can you get the piece the arm piece for itself? You can buy the arm tubes. You can get them online. There are various different sellers on eBay, especially if you're not in the UK. I'm sure you can find someone that does them. s -Bend Tubes for Technics. But you need to take it apart and put it on yourself. Problem is, which you need to bear in mind too, is if your S-Bend arm is damaged to that extent, what's to say that your bearings are not damaged in your arm as well? Right? Your bearings might be damaged. Your um, plastic central section that holds the tube that could also be damaged. If that's the case, buy a new arm tube assembly. Buy a new assembly. So the new assembly, like I stated when I was taking this out of the video, is the actual support bracket, the central section that goes around the plastic central section. You will have bearing tube with the bearings either end, a pivot, that locks it in. You have the pivot on the top that goes into the ball bearings, the tube, the weight attachment on the back, which is made out of plastic with the rubber gasket and um, brass section underneath, the tube, the socket, and the wiring. This entire section is screwed underneath with two screws. Obviously, you have to resolder the arm in the actual arm wires back onto the PCB, but that's how it connects up. OK, if you can't solder or you think you can and you've got you're sitting at home, a black spur or silver line soldering iron station that costs you about a tenner with the cheapest non leaded solder you can possibly get. Don't even bother trying it. Give it to a technician. Let them judge what's needed. Not everybody out there wants to rip you off. The amount of people that I've had come through my doors that point blank can't afford to get this work completed, right? I say to them, if your bearings are okay, but your arm tube is bent, but you're still tracking okay, so in other words, it's not sitting at a kink and the stylus isn't sitting at an angle and your channel connections are coming through, if it still plays okay and you're happy to keep it, would you like me to keep it on there for you? Now, some professional techies will turn around and say, that's not professional. But look, there's a big difference between having to replace an arm section if everything still functions and the tube needs replacing. If that's all it needs and you change the tube or someone just keeps it as it is. People use these arms damaged without realising it. They genuinely do. I get people that have had these from new where they've dropped something on top of the arm and they're bent, but they've been playing with it absolutely fine. And if that's the case and you're happy with that, keep it as it is. If it's not broke, don't fix it. Well, it is broke, but fix it. But if you don't want to fix it, and if it still works, keep it as it is. But finding somebody to do the work for you, to give you their honest opinion, strip the arm down, look at everything, is, is very, very important. Arcee, thanks. Finally got the answer. Do you come across many people who ask to have the quartz lock removal mod? And if so, are there drawbacks? No drawbacks, mate. Quartz lock removal... Um, the physical lock at zero is a very, very, very simple job. Very simple. Removing the ball bearing and the springs out of the slider when done correctly. Again, a very, very simple job. If you're removing the ball bearing and spring from the slider, you need to do the bypass as well. If you don't do that, the lock is still there. In other words, you're doing this, right? You can hear it click. And obviously it goes through there, it locks at zero. Some of these decks, depending on how they're calibrated, when you move it away from zero and that green light starts to turn off, it starts to speed up quickly. Some of them go smoothly all the way through the range to zero, right? If you remove the ball bearing in spring and you start moving that to the zero point where that light goes on, just because the ball bearing and spring isn't there to make the physical click that you can feel 
doesn't mean that the lock is not engaged. The lock is always engaged. If you look, I don't know if you can see it through, through the camera on that. Well, you can't see it. But there's a physical indentation on the board, a break in the board for the lock, right? That's what engages the zero point. So in other words, whether the ball bearing is there or not, the lock will still activate. You have to bypass the lock, then recalibrate the slider. Sometimes you can lose range by doing that. Sometimes. Now, if you're going to physically bypass the quartz on the motor, on the main board itself, so in other words, when you touch the side of the platter, where you look at the strobe, it starts to fight your fingers. You'll see the strobe start to do this when you put pressure on the platter. If you use the platter to slow your tracks down, by bypassing the motor in that respect with the quartz, you'll be able to touch the platter. It will slow down gradually without fighting your fingers. Easy as anything to mix with. It really is. But again, that combination along with the bypass can ruin the range slightly. I can get it to zero fine, but you might lose a bit of range. Um, no drawbacks to it. Any drawback really to doing that in terms of bypassing it through the main board is if you use a, a set of turntables with everything as standard, you may run into problems where you just can't mix on them because you're too used to your own turntables. Um, it's quite handy doing that with M5Gs. A lot of people like I used to do that for in the past. Um, it used to be, people used to benefit from that massively because as you all well know now, digitally controlled slider units on the M5G and the Mark VI does help to do this on those turntables. You'll find you go, you go from not mixing a pancake on them to actually locking mixes because you can be more hands-on with the turntable. Big thing in my book with that. So there's no real drawbacks with this. Like if you're using an M3D or a Mark V slider, because both use exactly the same slider inside a Mark II, you can install them, you can calibrate them. And as long as they're calibrated to the correct setting and you set the frequency to the correct frequency system of 262.08 on the main board, then you run into no problems at all. Other than the fact that the green LED will not work. Because as you'd imagine, with an M3D and a Mark V, there's no click, there's no switch, there's no ball bearing and spring. So how's the light going to turn on unless you physically hit the switch that you would have had on the M3D and the Mark V? You can't do it. You have to physically install a switch to do that. So you can install a stealth switch like I did with the green camouflage one that's sitting at home at the moment. Um, or you have the LED physically wired on so you can then tap the power with a resistor in line from another area on the turntable and then actually have it so that you can have the LED permanently on. You can have it in different areas. It's all things you can do. It's all different things you can do. That's my 10 pence on pitch controls. And that answers your question with that. What else have we got here? Um, I'm loving this. Keep your questions coming, guys. This is brilliant. Tones. Oh, yeah, one more. As I said, I have two gold limiteds from 96. We'll check you out. 1,200 limiteds by any chance? I've got a pair sitting here. Uh, it has a quartz lock button, but have a lock position on zero. So that base is from then Mark II. Mark II slider unit. I've got a pair here at the moment. They've got Mark II slider units in them, and they also have reset switches. Don't ask me why they did it, mate. That's what they did. That's what they decided to do. Silver hilt. My 1210's in real good shape. Getting some face plates for them this year to go with my new silver mixer. Sweet. That's really cool, mate. Face plates are really good. Only advice I'll give you with face plates is obviously everything sits flush with them. With face plates, they push the thickness up of the actual level of the turntable. So where your buttons will be sticking out slightly, they'll all be flush. So you have to just bear that in mind when you use them. And also, if your decks are in really good condition with no scuffs or scratches, the best advice I would give you with face plates is buy yourself some self-adhesive felt. It's quite thin. Stick it in the corners and the surrounds of the face plates. So when you put them on and take them off, you're not going to be scratching bare aluminium or bare metal on top of your um, original cabinet plimps. That's the last thing you want to do. I've seen that happen so many times where you start getting circular marks around corners because they're leaning on the edge with the pitch and it's bare metal touching the top of the coating from the, uh, the original coated area of your Technics. So yeah, be careful with that. But that's a really good one. Glad you're, you're, getting, you're keeping your Technics happy. Uh, Diva Disco, can you mount a Mark 7 arm assembly onto a Mark 2? I've literally just told you you can. <laughs> you just joined at the wrong time, mate. So like I said, the top section of the arm assembly, like when you buy an arm assembly from a Mark 2, they fit onto the base. All right, you can do it, yes. AC, hi Jay, I moved countries recently, had to sell my trusty RP7000s. 
and DJM to make room in the van. I've got 1.5 to replace my setup. What do you suggest I get? If you're getting more, well, if you're getting turntables again, look, let's be realistic here, mate. If you were happy with your RP 7000s, go for the Mark IIs. Go for the 7000 Mark IIs if you were happy with how they function. They are good decks. Like I said, you're basically getting a Pioneer PLX 1000, a straight 150, Audio Technica. They're all the same turntable, all made in the same factory. You're getting the best of all of them. And also you're getting the uh, the torque adjustment there as well. So highly recommend you look at the 7000 Mark IIs if you are wanting to go down that route. You can go for the Mark 7s. I mean, I've got Mark 7s and they are great. Don't get me wrong, but they're light as a feather. Dampening's terrible on them. Um, there's a few things you need to do to them to get them up to the level that I'd be happy with using on the road. They're more for home use than live use, if that makes sense. I hope that helps you either way, mate. What else have we got here? Um, the Nunaki or Anunaki. Jay, is it possible that the new 1200 Mark 7 units are built by Hampin on our third party since Technic's previous patent expired on the older 1200 Mark series? It's not made by Hampin. I could tell you that now. I haven't actually found out who creates those units. I mean, Panasonic are very hush hush with that. Especially with me, as you'd imagine, after all the grief I caused them with my Mark 7 videos, because I am, as everybody is aware by now, I am the guy who found the problems here in the UK with the dead spots on the pitch. Lots of issues caused. Uh, I'm not going to get into that. It's all been resolved now, obviously. But um, no, they're very, very secretive on where they, they get parts and who does them. RC, oh, thanks for answering my questions. And by the way, my 1210s are booked in for March 20th. <laughs> looking forward to it. I didn't actually realise that. So whoever you are, I'm Mr. RC. I look forward to working on your decks, mate. DJ, can you replace the coils on the main lead if they have to be soldered on? Coils on the main lead? Are you talking about the mains cable wiring? If you're talking about that, yes, of course they have to be soldered on. And yes, you can replace them. Calls on the main motor assembly or the stator, you have to buy the new stator assembly, you can replace the cores, but I'm not getting down that route. I'm not doing that. Not, not when you can buy the stator still. Burner, how to lower brightness on LEDs? I'm not telling you that. Very, very sorry, but that is something I'm keeping hush with. That's like going into KFC and asking for the Colonel's secret recipe. I am not telling anybody this. My, so this is the reason why I don't tell people this. You get people to watch my videos that ask me these questions pretending to be people that are just at home wanting to change LEDs over. And they go, oh, great, now I know that I could do it to all my turntables. And I'm pretty much one of the only people out there who replaces LEDs and actually changes the resistance of the LEDs to the correct voltage level, the correct output level. Otherwise, they're blind and you're like, oh, like this with the pitch LED, 3345 and the strobe as well. It's really important that you get that right. So no, that's uh, that's I'm keeping sealed when it comes to LED output. That's something I'm not answering. Any DIY bits like that, I don't answer questions to, just to make you aware. Uh, Nick Roberts, good to see you watching, mate. I have a mint set of 12, 10 Mark IIs. Would it make sense wrapping them to protect the surface and how much cost-wise? Right, okay, so great question. And yes, of course it does. Wrapping is going to be your safest method instead of using what well, we're saying deck plates earlier for the exact reason that they can scratch. Now, if you do it properly, you can cover them over without scratching them. Vinyl wrapping, as with anything, if I show you an example of one I've done, hang on a second. Let's show you this one. So this is a one you wouldn't have probably seen. This is using architectural wrap by 3M. This is the Dynock range vinyl. You can't really see it under this light, but it is a textured vinyl wrap you can just about see it can't you so the idea with vinyl wraps it protects anything that's underneath it you use a 3m primer around the edges stops anything from tacking and lifting up cheaper vinyl what you tend to find happens is give it a few months when heat hits areas that they shouldn't hit it'll start to pick and lift off you'll find that um, the edges will start to peel back and lift as well and also, if you scratch the vinyl, you can't just heat it up to get it back to shape. 3M vinyl is a lot easier and a lot more malleable in terms of repairing if anything happens. But with these vinyl wraps, this is a pretty good example, actually. So as you can see on here, I don't heat bend anything around the insides. Everything is cut with surgical blades. This is no bull. This is truth. 
Every single turntable that is vinyl wrapped by me, no matter what condition or chips that you can see, they are hand cut. The only parts that are machine cut are the platters. So if people ask for the vinyl to be on top of the platter, has to be machine cut. Think of it logically. It has to be machine cut because you want it perfect circle. So many of these I see where people don't want to spend the money and machine cut them. They cut them with Stanley blades and cheap hobby knives and they scratch the rubbish out of, they scratch the crap out of the sides of the platter. Horrible thing to do. Don't even bother. Everything around all of the pitch area, surgical bladed, strobe assembly, um, start and stop. The operation based assembly in general is all hand cut. Even the pop up surrounds, everything you see there. Everything you see there is hand cut of surgical blade. Um, now, it's up to you whether you want me to use primer. So if you do want to get to a point six months to a year down the line, that you feel like changing the wrap, which some people do do, or, um, you know, just want to take it off because you want to go back to the original. Using the primer, if you've got a really bad condition set of techniques, obviously using primer basically makes the, the adhesive stronger. Right, so you put it round the corners. So once that vinyl sticks, it's like poo to a blanket. Right, it's going to stick down. It's not going anywhere. If you don't want me to do that, and you want to be able to take it off at a later date, I can wrap it without primer. That's fine. There's no issues with that. I've done it for many, many people before. Things to bear in mind with wrap: if you're going to cover over the original plimps is obviously original graphics, depending on what style of wraps you were going for. I had this conversation with a customer yesterday. I have this all the time. If you go for single layer, single colored vinyl wraps, they're not thick like with textured vinyl. So when you put it over the top and you heat the top or you push it over the top and manual everything over and use all the concurves, um, you may see the original graphics underneath. So this is something to bear in mind. So if you're looking at camouflage, carbon fiber, Maybe the brushed wraps, you'll find you better cover over the original fine. Carbon fiber is by far the best in terms of covering any impurities over chips, scuffs, dents, breaks in the big breaks. You get some of them that have physical areas where things have fell on top and they've bent the bread, bent the plimp slightly, but they've got breaks like between the 33 and the 45s, things like that. Covers them over really well. So camouflage and carbon fiber, they are the two number one sellers that I offer. They're the best go-tos. But yeah, it's definitely an option for you. You can do that. Just bear in mind if it's in bad condition around certain areas, you have to sort of judge to yourself. If I put it down, will I be taking it off again? Because if you do, I have to use primer. Okay. If it's in that good of a condition, though, do you really need to wrap them? They look good if you pick the colour. thing is, if you ever get to a point where you decide you don't want to keep them anymore and you want to sell them, you're going to start thinking to yourself, I'll get them done in green. Not the one that's behind me there. Look at my rack. The green and the teal blue. You get them done, what's the chances of somebody else liking that colour? I had a pair that was, um, I, I, I had them sprayed by the Kawasaki British Superbike team. While the guys that sprayed, sprayed bikes for Kawasaki Superbikes, right? For British Superbikes. He sprayed my turntables when I had a pair of Mark, one of my pairs of Mark twos, I should say, like quite a few over the years. Sprayed them in Kawasaki green with a iridium, um, iridium petrol blue style pearl within the top coat and flake looked wicked absolutely unreal but not everybody was keen on it you had to really like that color to commit to buying them another example of this i wrapped a pair the only pair you will find anywhere in the world i guarantee this anywhere in the world i wrapped a pair of m3 mk3ds which are limited edition, not limited edition they're imports from japan only on the Japanese market, MK3Ds are basically M3Ds, like a Mark 5. I wrapped them in a custom printed, well, I printed it myself with my old vinyl printer, Doom, the game, Doom wrap. Sent a copy of the images once it was all completed over to um, John Romero, who is the creator of id Software. He is basically Doom. He's Mr. Doom. He loved them, right? I then sold them to sub to a customer. Wish I didn't do it now because they were just perfect. But they are the only pair in existence. But again, you need to like Doom to want to buy that. <laughs> Do you see where I'm coming from? So make sure you choose wisely if you ever plan on selling them. Because you'll end up biting yourself in the backside if you don't. Let's go with the other plimps I've got. Uh, any more Any more questions on here? Do, 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 do. Oh, there is. Bloody hell. 
Uh, Chai Towns, DJ Kids, end up getting the Reloop 7000 Mark IIs. What is your experience with the 8000? They're exactly the same turntable with straight with a straight arm um, and the MIDI control. The turntable is exactly the same. That's it. Okay. Also, Jay, do you know what the extra dial on the back of the tone arm of the M5G is? That's tension adjuster. So you can basically adjust the tension for movement of the arm. Have a look on the online. There's plenty about that online. I have it set to loose, to be honest. I don't bother with any of that. Just looks cool. <laughs> you know. Saki the plumber, it's for scratching. You tighten for scratching, loosen for listening. There you go. Tension adjuster. Nick, thanks for the advice. You're very welcome. Ryan, what do you think is the best Technics deck ever made? They're all the same. They're all the same, guys. You can put a Mark II board in a Mark V, an M5G board with modification to the connectors. Same as a Mark II board. Limited boards the same as an M3D board. They're all the same. My honest opinion on what's the best looking Technics out of all of them is the M5G. I love the M5G looks-wise. just hate using it. I had a pair. I hated them. I hated them. But when you modify them and do the quartz bypass, they're beautiful to use. It's really weird. But yeah, the best looking is definitely the M5G. Best out of all of them is always going to be the original OG, which is going to be the Mark II. 12, give me a pair of Box Fresh 1210 Mark IIs any day of the week. Any day of the week. Thank you. I own 5G, so I have the manual, and that's what the Panasonic says. Exactly. He's got it. Armin, oh well, J is live. I think the extra dial is for fixating the tone. It's already been clarified that, so we've got that. Got it, thanks, Armin. I bet J will, will know better than me. Yeah. Tension adjuster is the correct term. Thank you. It's got my third Technics today, Mark V, the happiest man on the planet. Good man, Mark V, I tell you, over in the UK, they're quite hard to get hold of in good condition as well. Getting them in good condition is extremely hard. Mark VI is the best looking. Again, I do like the Mark VI. Quite, quite rare that I really get them in here. If you want something that's newer than the Mark II, which is going to be the best of all of them in terms of the digitally controlled pitch, if you like that sort of thing, that's what you go for, that and the Mark M5G. So again, if you're happy with that, that's what you do. Uh, the shizzle. Do you think it would be possible for Panasonic to start making parts again for Mark IIs? That that ship has sailed. That's gone. That's never going to happen, unfortunately. They have got no intention of making parts for Mark IIs, hence why we're having to now use parts from the Mark VII's, GRs, etc., like the arm assembly parts, to fit them onto Mark II up to the M5G, the Mark VI. It's because they want you to use the Mark VI. Sorry, the Mark VII. They want you to use the Mark VII. That is exactly why they won't do it. They want you to stop stop repairing your Mark IIs. When they go, I think when they originally made these units, they did not. <laughs> as matter what anyone says saying about they they made them for DJ use, they didn't. Okay, they did not. I keep seeing comments all the time about this SL120, otherwise known as a twelve hundred Mark One rotary pitch control on thirty three and forty five. The first initial version of the twelve hundred, right? That's that. They then replaced it with the slider unit, as we all know and love, that goes up and down, right? The slider unit. DJs then discovered that that was easier to use than using rotary. DJs jumped on the bandwagon. Next thing you know, Technics and Panasonic start flying around flyers saying that the Mark II is basically the 1200s, the number one for DJ users due to precision. Da -la -la -la. It was after DJs discovered it. For the last time, DJ's <laughs> Panasonic did not make these for beat mixers. They didn't. They never did. When they first they discovered them, DJ's discovered it. Panasonic discovered that DJ's like using the slider unit. Next thing you know, they're marketing them towards DJ's and radio wear. That's what it was. So if you're one of these guys out there that thinks I'm wrong, do your homework. I know that for a fact as well. This isn't just me saying it for the hell of it. This is factual, okay? They discovered that DJs were using them. Panasonic had no idea that DJs were doing this until somebody saw it happening, and that's what happened. And then started marketing it towards it, went, oh, we've got something here. DJs like that pitch control. That's it. No rubbish, no messing around. End of. 
Uh, analog. What alternative spindle can be used, and which is you like the original? I can't find a, a small group amount even on eBay here in Europe. Adderall oil. Adderall. Go on to again. Go on DJSpares.com. It will go through to Kevin's eBay store. Um, he sells the oil on there. You can buy a little tub of it or a bigger tub. Job done. Aris Music. Power Sonic didn't care for the DJs. They still don't. As much as what you, as much as what you think. DJM12, how you doing? Jay, sorry if this has already been asked. What do you think about quartz lock mod to remove jittering platter? Again, simple job to do. You have to recalibrate your slider if you find it starts to lose um, its, its position at zero. Um, I do the lock removal and the jitter removal for the board and try it. Some people will say don't recommend it, it can cause problems. It doesn't cause problems. It doesn't. It's just not recommended if you're not skilled enough to physically remove the components. I'm not going to tell you what components to do that. There's plenty of homework you can do online for this. But I've had I've had my own, every single pair of Technics I've ever owned, apart from my new ones, which obviously Mark 7s, have all had that completed with no issues. Some people get on with it. Some people don't. Glenn English, I put new tone on my Mark II, but the height adjustment is slightly different on both decks when set at zero. Right, okay. Put a new one on one. Did you do it on the other? If you find that your height adjustment is low on one and high on the other, but they're both set exactly the same, and your arm's obviously bent. If you find that the height adjustment gap distance in here is set incorrect on one, but the other one's set level, then it's not built to the right height. Simple as that. Simple as that. Sean, I remember the DSL 1500 back in 84. Many clubs had them back then. Exactly. This is the thing. DJs loved using it, but Panasonic never actually catered for DJs until the Mark, until the Mark II was released, and they realized that DJs liked the slider unit. So all these people that say that they did it for DJs, they're talking at the backside. If you're one of those guys, you're wrong, okay? But yes, they, it's, lots of turntables were used for DJ use. doesn't mean that they were perfect for it, but Panasonic hit the nail on the head when Technics brought out the Mark II. And uh, next, that's an, that's an excellent question. Is the original grease can get hard and then you can't adjust it anymore? I heard that some people use graphite based grease instead. Maybe Jay can say there's a lot of ways you can do this, but like I said, the safest bet is just to buy the Adderall oil. Go on to DJ Spares. In fact, if you type in DJ Spares on YouTube, type in DJ Spares and Spindle. He's got a video on there of him using it, using graphite as well. So, yes, you can. You can do that. You haven't got to use much neither. It's not, it's not the cheapest thing on the planet to buy, but that's, that's what I recommend. I use it. It's good stuff. Not true. The SL 1800 was made for DJs in 78. Again, I'm not I'm not arguing with this. I'm not really not. I don't need to. Look, it's, it's not needed. I had an 1800, ironically, as well. Jay, your insights are super helpful. Thank you for the answering all the questions. You're very welcome. Back then, they were advertised as the term table of choice for radio DJs. Right, okay, radio DJ, fading from one deck to the other. Pitch control on the Mark II for beat mixers. The turntable of choice for radio DJs back in the 80s, 70s and 80s would have just been push button, fade it up. Am I making sense with that? I can't be talking out the backside on this. And Panasonic, Panasonic told me this, <laughs> told me this. I'm only, look, I only go by what I'm told. I don't go sprouting rubbish or saying things because I feel that it's the right thing. But yes, there were posters about and radio DJs I classed back in the 70s to 80s would have been different to what you've classed as a DJ that's like now, for an example. 1200 Mark II was based off the 1800 only with pitch slider. Slightly different when set to zero. What? Wow. Fair enough, mate. Legend, can you clarify the problem with two zero points? Yes, you need to recalibrate your slider unit. Take the slider unit, disconnect it from the board, take the unit out, Multimeter on, set it to the correct settings, 2.7K, start from there. Pop it back on there and make sure that your um, your board is set to zero. bit tricky to do if you're not doing without a frequency counter, but you can do it with a screwdriver with a platter on and keep adjusting until you get plus six. Plus six is your sweet spot. Once you've got that right, you're good to go. 
BMX AF, if wisely buying good condition Mark II second hand, how much should be set aside for when you are serviced? Inspect it. <laughs> now that is a bloody good question. And unfortunately of a lot of this, how long is a piece of string? I hate saying it like this because look, I've had turntables, like this pair here that I stripped, this one I stripped down, this individual turntable, I'll do the second one tomorrow. But when you get turntables that are booked in for a service, this pair is going to need, I think you need slider units if as long as they, if they go correctly, I'll regrease them. And depending on the, the carbon track wear, then we'll rebuild them. As of next year, if you look on my website, justtechnics.co.uk, go on the website, you'll see there's free service options on there. As of next year, like stated on the site, there's only going to be one service option for just for servicing and one service option there for wrapping and servicing. Keep it as simple as possible. That's what I'm doing. Every single deck moving forward for next year are all going to be service and deep clean too. They're all going to have slider units, pitch trims, shader cloths, uh, tactile switches, servicing of the boards, diodes, new oscillator crystals as well. Nobody else does that as standard. I can't believe it here in the UK. People don't want to spend money on parts. They'd rather just do the bare minimum and make maximum profit than actually put the work into it. This is why I don't... This is why I've got, I haven't got a lot of love for a lot of people here in the UK that are technicians because they can they know they can get away with doing bare minimum because something spins around and it still works. They'll just put it back in, clean it out and put it back in again without having to touch anything. And again, it really annoys me how people can do this. It really does. Um, I got a lot of flack off this over the years. From I class them from jealous people who don't like the competition. And I'm sorry, but if you don't, take the time to complete jobs properly and troubleshoot errors and things that you've caused, then you only got yourselves to blame. I've had it with audio cables that have been left and right channels been the incorrect heights. Um, you know, so no, you pay to have it done properly. Pricing from general servicing was starting for a pair of Technics was £150 for a pair. Now, guaranteed on top of that, slider units, £60 for the pair. Pitch trims, if you want them, £30 for the pair. Shader cloths, five, six pounds each. Tactile switches for four of them, a tenner. These things aren't expensive, but when they start adding together and then you add on top of that the courier costs, courier with APC collection and re-delivery for a pair with a £1,000 worth of insurance either way is £94, right? 100 quid basically for courier. So you need to work out whether you can take, bring them down to me in person and save the fees or with the way that fuel is now, it's so bloody expensive. Do you really want to be dropping them down in person? But... It might work out the same cost. I should get to see us. We'll get a bit of a chat, don't we? Harrison, how you speak, you look for a very honest person and businessman. Thank you very much. Well, look, this is the thing. I say I don't sprout rubbish. I say it as it is. I've been doing this for a very, very long time now. Um, you know, if something, if you bring me something in and it's damaged but still works, I'm not going to automatically, the minute you walk out the door, go, he needs a new arm assembly. All right? I don't do that. It's not, it's not how we do business. You can easily, I can easily make profit on parts that you don't need. And I could be dishonest and tell you that you need them when you don't. The karma's going to get you if you do it. You can't do that. That's not how you run a business. It's to build rapport with your customers. Do it properly. If you do it properly, you get recommended. You get reviews left for you. You get, you, you get your name shared around. It's how you run a business. Here we go. We've got more questions coming in. But thank you, Aris. I appreciate that. Being sensible, I'll put a side over a monkey or so and drop them off to you. That's, you got, you got it right, mate. That's exactly what you do. Good man. Just on the safe side. If you don't need it, you don't need it. If you do, you do. At least you've got the money there. Remember the guy in the yellow hoodie who said he serviced four to six pairs a day. If that's not cutting corners, I don't know what is honestly is the policy. Honestly is the policy. Yes, it is. And um, yeah, he's, it's just rubbish. He probably, if he did, all he was doing was just literally taking everything out. Not even, he didn't even clean them. Half the guys I speak to don't even clean their turntables. All they're doing is the bare minimum. A few solder joints re resolder and put a couple of cables on and two pitch. And that's it. It's disgusting, really. But yeah, you're right. How long have you been doing this, Jay? Did you study electronics or anything before? Right, okay, here we go. So my background with this, guys, because a lot of people ask me about my electronic background and what I used to do. Now, I'm the first person to tell every single person here and everyone asked me, there's no fancy diplomas, 
No fancy MV, MVQs or that rubbish. When, through school, I did crap. Through everything at school. I left school. I was bullied through school. Bullied through work. Because uh, ironically as well, up until I was about 20. It sounds ridiculous. About 20. So I'm 37, right? Since I was about 20, I was bullied through school and through work. Didn't have many mates. This is no sob story bollocks either. Didn't have any, didn't really have any mates. My so-called best friends from school, the minute I left school, pissed off and moved away and didn't even tell me. I went actually went around to his house and he wasn't there. Right? So it goes to show my best friend vanished, who was thought was my best friend. And it was just me. So I spent a lot of my time when I was at school. <laughs> I'm say this regardless of saying it. That's not even saying it. I spent a lot of time when I was at school locked away in my bedroom playing games, PlayStation, Mega Drive, consoles, building electronics kits. So do you remember you used to get the breadboard kits where you used to build your own build your own alarm system, build your own like all in one, like a thousand in one electronics kits. We used to have the battery in a nine volt battery, wire things through with LEDs. Uh, make your own circuits up out of a massive thick booklet. I basically, I had two of them back in the day. When I was at school, I had one of them. Got from that, started building more intricate systems going along the way. From what I learned from these kits that I used to build, I used to have big thick books on it because I used to be into computer repair. So what got me into electronics was computer repair. So I used to have all these big thick books and schematics and things on how to troubleshoot main boards, right? how to install drivers, how to, if you have problems with GPUs, how to fix problems with RAM, how to do problems with Windows. So I used to deal with Windows 3.1, 95, 98, ME, 2000, uh, XP when it first came out. I had to slip through when I used to work for a computer shop in Colchester. We, I was the first person in the company to install XP when it first came out, which is hilarious. Blue screen of death, left, right and centre. So I've always been around electronics and computers, but computer repair was my thing in the background. It was always something that I did, but I didn't really, you know, advertise. I used to just do it on my own. So it was for my own thing. If I used to buy fans, for an example, for a computer, instead of having them all connected up to a, a fancy switch of LEDs and buy one, I'd build my own. I'd build my own switch. I know how to solder the wires. I know how to heat shrink. I learned to solder when I was about 14, but then actually progressed properly. So at the age of 37, my soldering, I'd like to think, is pretty good. It's up there, you know. Um, but that's the score with that. When I started working for DJ shops, I was I worked for a DJ shop on and off, three times on and off, and I was there for a long time. If I was still there now, I would probably be the old, oldest remaining member of staff, you know, that was there, basically, if I had have stayed. There is a bit of a track record of losing staff, and I, I'm not surprised, to be honest. Horrible place to work for. But behind the scenes with that, I used to service Technics, because obviously when I got into Technics and I started stripping them down, do you remember back in the day, guys, there used to be a big, thick book called How to DJ Properly? Remember that book? It used to be a grey or a white book, which I still wish I knew where it went. And literally in there was a little section on modifications that you could do. One of which was adjusting, adjusting the brake to make the deck spin backwards, which God knows why you want to have it on full, but it's to cause lots of problems doing that. And the other one was adjusting the pitch range to make it more accurate and increase the range to make it less accurate, but increase the range. I spotted that and I was like, OK, let's have a look at this then. So I obviously had a look at took the top of the plastic cover off like everybody else would do. I got hold of the service manual. This is just... The internet, I mean, I had the internet, it's when I, was, when I was with NTL, this would have been NTL World before it was Virgin. I got hold of the service manual online, I downloaded the service manual, I had all the traces that I wanted, all in different colours, and made notes of the important parts that I needed to worry about, and started having my own spin-on parts. I knew where to reroute LEDs from, for an example, I then learned how to change the LED colours, and then control the resistance, so that you didn't obviously have the LEDs being super, super bright. Um, you know, this is all things that I learned myself progressing through the years of electronics how to use one of these properly not just be able to use one for continuity like i showed you but how to actually use the multimeter properly how an oscilloscope works so i've got one here obviously um frequency counter how you'd use that and incorporate that with your turntable to obviously calibrate the main zero position of the deck probably the easiest thing out of everything on it so i self-taught myself from an early age electronics 
because I spent all of my time until I got my first girlfriend in my room, you know, repairing electronics and building my own kits. Technics boards themselves, these boards, they might be intricate in how they work and look at them is very daunting. But when you get your head around it, they're a very simple circuit with the way things are mapped out. And if you can read schematics and you can check voltages and you know what to look for, this is the most important thing. What I learned from repairing computers and what I was taught a very long time ago, because I was a trainee computer engineer, I genuinely was. Um, when, when you have an issue, right? So say for an example, a computer, if you've got a problem with a computer, graphics card goes wrong. Resolution doesn't want to go up to a set scale and you can only have it set uh, 800 by 600. Right. No bigger than that. Won't go any bigger, but you know that it can. When you find when you find the problem and you solve the problem, most people will go, oh, I've done it. Fix the problem. But you need to understand it isn't just that. That's a very simple way of looking at it. It's like, hang on, there's the problem. I fixed it. Problem solved. But what about what's in the back? What about what caused the problem to happen in the first place? So computers, drivers that get outdated, right? You change the drivers around, something's still going to be there. Something's still going to be causing the problem. What happened again? You have to then stop it from happening again. Isolating the issue is basically what I'm saying. So troubleshooting is isolating the issue. So find the problem. I just find the problem, change that, but also find out what caused the problem to happen in the first place. So it's troubleshooting from start to finish. If you've got that mindset of anything electronics, of anything in life, to be honest, if, you can, if you've got that mindset of, this is what the problem I have here, how do I fix that problem? And how do I fix and find what caused the problem to stop it from happening ever again? You could do it with business, you could do it with bikes, you do it with cars, do it with anything. If you put your mindset in the right place. So yeah, I'm self-taught. Always have been, always will be. I don't feel the need to, if I really wanted to be like these other guys and fancy technicians that have all of the city and guilds and stuff, look, if I really wanted to do that, I'd get the education and do it. I'd pay the money and do what everybody else does. But with a turntable such as the Mark IIs and things, it isn't really needed. As long as you've got a background of dealing with electronics, you don't need that. Just because someone, look, we're seeing this proofs in the pudding. You've got people that have got all these fancy degrees and things who flash it in your face saying, oh, absolutely fantastic they are. But then when you give them things and you get back and they've got problems, they'll argue the toss because of their qualifications and say, what, you don't trust me because of this? I'd rather give it to someone whose background is passionate about what they do, you know, and actually, they're not, put it, put it like this, a DJ, I produce music as well. I'm a producer and a DJ. But DJ now 20, 21 years, 22 years. Repairing these for God knows how long. So where I was getting at before was with the whole technic side of things. When I used to work for the DJ shops, the manager there, inwardly, he weren't very happy with me. Because what he doesn't know is I used to serve as technics for customers. You see, when I first started with such and such company, I'm not going to mention names, uh, we used to, I used to work in a sales shop. I used to work in the showroom. There was three different places he was, and each one I was in a showroom. We used to have customers come in asking about techniques. He'd turn around and go point blank. No, blank the customer, don't give a crap. Because he can't do it and doesn't make the money out of it. We had another company in Colchester that obviously now doesn't do it at all. But they used to go there. Before they walk out the door, here's my number. So I used to have customers dropping off on Monday, uh, Monday evening, or first thing Monday morning, before I went to <laughs> where I went to work, dropping off to my old flat with me and the missus there in the morning or in the, in the evening, dropping their decks off to me to be serviced, and then picking them up on the weekend or the Friday. So again, after work Friday, there they were. And this is how the whole five day booking came to play because it was Monday to Friday, drop off on the Monday, get it on the Friday, right? It's all changed somewhat now because of what the way that I do things with more space and more things that I offer. That's how that came into fruition. So I used to serve as techniques on the side while working for the DJ shop. <laughs> the, the DJ shop I used to work for. And uh, I used to come into work. <laughs> I used to come into work. I used to have LED kits. You know this whole under platter LED thing? I hate them personally, but I used to, when I first did a design for them, the first one I actually ever did wasn't just a single color. My ones were actually, they were multicolor, which were flowing color. So I designed a circuit that used to change color. And it literally used to be a slow burn color change. Not one of these Christmas lights on off. It was a slow burn color change. And I used to have them underneath the pitch. And I had them battery driven as well. 
so you can recharge them. That way there's no noise into the audio system. It's battery driven. You can recharge them. You can link more than one together. And uh, that's what I did. I used to turn up the work and go, what do you think of this? Because I used to smoke, so I used to walk out, have a fag with him first thing in the morning. Check this out. Look on his face. Look on his face as a picture. Problem was, at one point, people used to talk. Word spread a little bit. Inwardly, I know that he knew what I did. But he used to say it was conflict of interest. Problem was, it wasn't conflict of interest because even though he used to sell Technics, he never used to repair them. Might have done the odd cable changeover, but there was no repair. I don't think it's conflict of interest if you don't offer a service or repair on Technics turntables in your shop. I offer something that you don't do. It's because it's a DJ. DJ equipment doesn't mean that it's conflict of interest. You don't do it. I do. And what do you think happened after I left? Me and this shop fell out. Other reasons happened. And um, he started servicing them. Didn't last very long. <laughs> For obvious reasons, it didn't last very long. But yeah, so I'm, I'm self-taught from start to finish. Um, always have been, always will be. Hence why I don't tell anybody my little secrets on some of the things I do. I get asked all the time, pitch calibration. I get asked all the time, LEDs, how you how you change the, 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 the brightness for LEDs. To someone that knows electronics, that's an easy question to answer. I'm not going to tell you. The thing is, it isn't just a case of telling you how to do it. You may be incompetent of taking the correct components out and replacing components. You may damage things even more. You know, it's like working on a power supply, knowing that, Something has to be replaced, and it's a 10, 10 pence component that has to be replaced inside a power supply of a computer. But you either change that component or you buy a new power supply for 100 quid, right? But you don't know how to change it. You don't know how to solder. And if you do do try and do that and you do it wrong, you could kill yourself, right? Because you're working with live electronics, power supply, dangerous things altogether. So you can electrocute yourself. What am I going to rather you do? Try and do it yourself or buy a new power supply. Check out, do you remember ages ago about the batteries? They used to have like the car batteries and the bike batteries. There was a video that was dotted around online. And this video, there was there was a battery that someone had opened up with a knife or sawed through the top of it. And he tipped it upside down. He said, if you cut through your battery, any car battery or bike battery, there's lots of single cell batteries would fall out. Now, the reason I say this is my dad, I mean, nothing matters anymore. He never watches any of my stuff, but <laughs> I haven't really talked to him, but... My dad thought that was real. He was going, did you see that on um, online that you can cut a battery open and it all falls out like that? I went, don't ever do it. You'll hurt yourself. It'll be like a scene out of bloody Alien where the, you know, where the, where the alien's like, you, you know, you, it's bleeding everywhere and it sinks through your hand. Don't do it. How do you think you get acid attacks? Do you know what I mean? It's pathetic. So yeah, this is why I don't tell people how to do things, the matter your, your background. And if you genuinely know what you're doing, you shouldn't be asking the questions. It's the truth. But that get, sort of answers the question, guys, as to, you know, how long I've been doing this for. And I'm sorry it was a bit long-winded, but where's the time? Christ, 10 to 6. Give it 10 minutes and I'll go. Best reviews are word of mouth. Absolutely, Sean. Absolutely, mate. Where are you based? I'm based in Colchester in Essex, uh, RO. So it's the UK, mate. Ryan, Jay is absolutely correct. The Mark II was not originally a specific DJ. Deck Technics made it. DJs discovered it. Thank you very much, Ryan. Nick, yep, used to buy them from Maplin. I worked for Maplin, funny enough. I actually worked for Maplin. If any of those of you that have been in Colchester, Maplin's, I um, I worked there. I actually <laughs> it used to be Odd Bins. It used to be a wine shop. Remember Odd Bins in Colchester? When they first ripped all that down, I rebuilt the inside, so we had gondolas, we had to work off spec sheets to get things right. I used to work in Maplins. I was their audio and electrical, one well, their audio and electrical specialists. So if you look at the opening day, if you were there on the opening day for Maplins, I was the poor bugger that let off the one of the big helicopters we had on offer that everyone brought back the next day broken because I couldn't figure out how to fly them. I had to demonstrate a helicopter. <laughs> I never told anybody this. I had to demonstrate a helicopter. Right, big helicopter, about 150 quid's worth for this voucher that we used to give people. You had me standing out there with a blue polo top on, with this little crowd of people. It was next to them, blockbusters. Remember blockbusters, right? They were next door to us. People were standing there watching. I had like a, a wireless earpiece explaining to people what this is, how you do it, etc. 
lifted it off the floor perfectly. I couldn't have done it any better. It was perfect, hovering perfect, wasn't moving. It's looking up at it like that. Got it over the big Maplin's entrance sign. And I crap you not, guys, I had the biggest gust of wind known to man. It flew over the roof. And all we could hear was the noise and it wasn't doing anything. And I had a crowd of people watching me while I'm trying to figure out how the hell I'm meant to get this helicopter down, which was nowhere to be seen. And we never got it back. We used to also have um, where the tills are. They used to be like big gondolas with um, hooks. We used to put batteries and all sorts of bits. Well, there used to be a hollow sheet behind it. We used to call it the never, the never zone or the, or the dead zone. Remember the film, The Dead Zone? We used to call it The Dead Zone. Basically, it was hollowed. And we used to do what was called battle copters. So you used to fly them around, little foam copters used to shoot each other and used to fall off and fall to the floor. Really robust. Well, what we used to do when we used to get bored when we used to work the late nights there, we used to fly them around wherever the hell we wanted. And uh, yeah, we flew it up. And there's probably about six or seven of them until they moved the gondolas out of the way where Maplins went bust basically and around online only when the stores went they would have had a nice surprise when they pulled the gondola forward because probably half a dozen helicopters there i mean there was at least six of them there when we were there when i was there uh, there was that what was the other thing Wrote control frequencies uh some absolute numpty didn't realize when they were putting out the gondolas on the edges you used to have remote control ferraris lamborghinis like 50 quid 40 quid ones on stack boxes we used to have them sitting there with the remote controls next to them so kids could have a go at them and take them around. And we used to show customers them as well. well what happened was whoever had put them out, put out, didn't realize that the frequencies were all the same. Instead of just leaving one controller there with a pack of batteries or something and chopping them over, or even just even better, changing the frequency over, some of them were fixed and you couldn't change them. You push one button on one, what do you think happens? It's like a scene out of Gone in 60 Seconds where he goes over the ramp, literally push accelerate on the controller, Every single car that was sitting there, all of them on every gondola, would all shoot off. We used to have them flying into adults. We had them flying into kids, flying into gondolas, smashing boxes. We used to break the cars. Oh, man, we had some fun there. So it's funny when you say Maplins, because I used, to, I used to help out with that. We used to sell capacitors, resistors, everything you can think of. Stupidly overpriced. But I was in the element being the geek. Well, I suppose I'm a bit of a nerd and a bit of a geek, but... It's not the everyday average geek you'd expect, I suppose. But yeah, Maplin's cool. Off. The DJ stuff there was terrible. Pro sound. <laughs> they print rediscover music on the Art 7 boxes now. I was laughing hard when seeing that. Yeah, rediscover music. Yeah. <laughs> to be honest, I laughed when I saw that as well, but I'm keeping stunt with this. Ryan, the guy in the yellow hoodie is a fraud, Sean. I, spent, I sadly spent over 1700 with him and had to take mine to Jay to... We worked on property and undo his bodge. Yeah, because you travelled about, what was it, six hours or whatever it was to get here for me to change over your slider units, didn't you, of your originals, which took me in under 20 minutes to do. Sean, you've got loads of mates on here now, so let's arrange a beer or three I could do of a road trip to Colchester. Mate, honestly, I appreciate this, Sean. It's, it's hard work. People don't understand how hard it is um, being self-employed alone, especially with what I do, this is the most cutthroat business you can imagine. And this is when people say, I can't I can't accept the criticism. Honestly, it's nothing to do with any of that. I've got, I'm very thick-skinned when it comes to people knocking or negative comments. You think I haven't seen it online before? How many videos, do you mean, how many people do you think comment and give negative things when I put videos about Mark Sevens or the GRs or... Um, what was it, the GR versus the belt drive video I did? I had all sorts of things thrown at me. I just laugh it off. The one with Mojax that I did for DJ City, I had some, some negative flack on that. But again, publicity, not all bad, not all of it's bad. All publicity is good publicity. People hear your name. They all look at you. They'll soon work out who's telling the truth. They'll soon work it out. But it hasn't been easy. It has not been easy. Uh, I don't just sit here, dream job, Day in, day out, this job is extremely difficult. Um, you know, I don't mind helping show people this sort of thing. It's a very involved job. Your head has to be screwed on at all times. If you have an off day, you have to stop. You have to go home you have to recuperate and come back when your head's on it. You, working with electronics is a, well, it's not an easy job. It really isn't. And people need to realise it. But thank you so much to those of you that actually support this. I really appreciate it. Um, well, we got message, message retracted. Oh, Liam. Okay, mate. 
Uh, the shiz, thanks for your honesty, mate. It's a refreshing change from all the fakeness of social media. I just look, I just say things how they are. If you do agree with me, you agree with me. If you don't, you don't. You know? I think that's how everything should be in this day and age. Everyone's too scared of saying what they really think. I don't care who I annoy, you know. <laughs> I've annoyed enough people over the years. More cutthroat repairing techniques than it is actually using them out of gigs. It's terrible. Hot glue, laugh out loud. Sorry, guys, I've got sleep in my eyes. Most unprofessional thing to do on a camera ever, but... Oh, so I thought should be doing that. Oh, alcohol cleaner. No, 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 no. It's one way of stinging your eyes. Poison yourself. <laughs> there we go. What's that? It's just come through. Chasing cultures to rest. It's finally found a trustworthy guy here in Germany who fixes my turntables, but it was so hard to find someone. This, this is the same situation, mate, in the UK. Anywhere, to be honest. Liam, I'd definitely break mine if, it, if I tried to do anything, which is why I sent them to you. <laughs> Jay, show everyone your birthday card. Oh, I can't. Oh. Okay. Hang on. I've still got it here. I will quickly show this. I'm only going to quickly, briefly, briefly show this. I don't want no repercussions from this. <laughs> Covering the face over again. So my brother, basically, that's a picture of me and my brother. So my brother's actually... <laughs> he merges him really well, but I'm not. That's all I'm going to show. That's never going anywhere, Sean. You're a legend for that. That was a nice surprise. I didn't know whether to be sick or or what when I got that through. Just uh, note for self for next time, Sean. I much, would have much preferred uh, you to send me some Guinness for you, mate, and send me that absolute atrocity. I tell you. <laughs> Cheers for that, Sean. Um, God, state my hair. Christ, I need a haircut. Look at this. <laughs> Lovely stuff. This is why I'm wearing a hat at the moment, for those of you that are wondering, all my videos. Haircut is needed. Uh, spelt stuff wrong to remove my message. I was just saying I missed the mark to strip down earlier and wonder if they are mine. No, 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 my friend. Yours, yours are sitting right there. That's all you're getting for the time being. But all I'm going to say to you, Liam, is they're basically done. Audio test, heat test is going to be the next thing. Make sure everything's all running to spec, and then those beauties are coming back to you. I've already loosely worked out the invoice for you as well, so all gravy. We've got new pitch, new trims, new shader, audio cable, internally grounded, slip mats that you wanted. They're looking beautiful, mate. They're looking absolutely stunning. This lad sorted me out twice. I've sorted you out, have I, Pop Bobby? <laughs> That's what she said. Really, really enjoyed this live, mate. You should do it more often, time permitting, of course. I will. No, I will be. Everything I tend to do now is going to be on YouTube mainly. Like I said on the video last night, um, there's going to be a dedicated area that I'm going to have in here that I'm going to have just with live videos. I can strip things down, explain how things work. Um, obviously not giving away too much information, but just things that people need to know. The other thing, actually, while we've got you, is internal grounding, guys. There's a lot of people on here that say it's a bad thing. Look, it's not. I know that I have I tend to say myself that if you've got, you've got your grounding cable there, just use it and stop moaning, basically. But there's a reason why I say this. Yeah. Internal grounding, all you're doing is grounding where the grounding cable went onto the side of the connection for your audio cable and grounding the chassis, right? Makes no difference. The only people that I would recommend do not internally ground their turntable, being totally realistic, are people that use them for hi-fi use that are going to be using them with valve amplifiers. Do not do it. You'll cause yourself problems. That and uh, purists, obviously, that want the original cable, no-brainer, keep the grounding cable. If you want the cleanest possible connection between arm and mixer, then obviously grounding cable is the way to go. If you do not want the grounding cable, use them for DJ use, get rid of it. Don't worry about what people say. There's all myths about it online, the spurious things I've seen over the years. Um, Christian from 1200s.com would probably agree with me if I said it anyway. The earlier models actually were internally grounded. Another nice little, nice little hint there for you as well. So for those that say that it's not a good idea and they never did it, they did. You should do your homework. Stop lying to people. I think, I think we'll leave it there, 
Shit, I left my TV turned on. Hang on, I've got my TV screens on at the moment as well. You should never do that. I'm the worst person for this. I'm always moaning at my missus for leaving the screen on because of screen burn, even though you don't really get it with LCDs or LED TVs that much. Right, have we got any more questions before I decide to get out of here? Because I'm getting hungry now, guys. Ryan, you're a good man, Jay. Wish you all the best and all the success in the world. You deserve it. Thank you ever so much, mate. Really appreciate it, Ryan. Man, this live session was awesome. Interesting. Do it again. I will. I will do it again. I promise you I will do it again from a different corner of the workshop. Maybe what I'll do is I'll move the... I'll move my beast out of the way. I've got my KTM sitting in the corner, my super juke. Um, so what we'll probably do, I'll find another nice area in the workshop and do this but oh I've got what I'm saying now yeah following on from yesterday's video I know it was an off-the-cuff not a very professional way of doing the video but honestly sponsorships are welcome okay it's no way of touting for money or anything like that was physical sponsorships if you know if anybody out there knows of anybody that would be interested in getting involved that literally you know, involved. It's not like I want someone for an example. There's no point having John Smith's Bakery, you know, sponsoring me. Even though, let's be realistic, I wouldn't say no if a bakery turned around and wanted to sponsor me and we were giving me free, free pastries. My missus wouldn't moan about it, and I certainly wouldn't. So that's a very bad example. If Guinness turned around, I can't say it. if Guinness turned around and said we'll sponsor you. Oh man, I'd be the I'd be the happiest person on the planet. Um, but yeah, ideally within the electronics industry, someone that either people out there that can either provide tools, soldering equipment, things to have me review, that sort of thing, that'd be fantastic. And of course, DJ suppliers in general are our ones that I deal with. Um, sadly, with a lot of bits that I tend to do reviews on, I do buy the equipment myself and people don't realise this when I when I do them. I pay out of my own pocket using money that I've earned you know, to buy them. So the mixers I purchased myself before I sold them. What I'd like to do in an ideal world is get enough memberships, because obviously memberships live on the channel now. Uh, for those of you that are subscribing, thank you. So for those that basically input the money from memberships, people that sponsor, etc., all of this, which I did in an ideal world, will go towards competition prizes, so prizes that you can win. So whereas I usually give away a turntable or uh, slip mats and all little things, it'd be nice to gradually build the prizes up and give them away, you know, for free. So ideally, in ter Technics turntables, like Christmas, and every, every year at Christmas, I do a Christmas competition. It's a Just Technics Mixmas competition, which is going to come up very soon, the end of this month, I'll announce that. Um, you know, I give things away every year. I'll do whatever I can to help people out and give freebies and stuff. It's awesome. So it'd be nice to give away some proper top-notch prizes as well. But if anybody out there is interested, hit me up. Seriously, sponsorships are seriously welcomed. <laughs> Just done a strip down myself. Just on my, on my tube. I'm interested. Please take a butcher's. I will do. I will have a look. Best ride in Colchester. <laughs> well, yeah. Yes, thanks, mate. My missus might have something to say about that. But that bike is, I took, I took that out this morning, funny enough. For those of you that don't know what it is, the KTM Super Duke 1290, a Gen 2, that thing is insane. I've got a Kawasaki ZX6R that I use daily, an old one just for getting to and from after the other bike was pinched. And uh, I thought I'd take it out, so I haven't used it for a couple of weeks. And man, oh man, did that thing wake me up this morning. A track mode with wheelie mode, anti-wheelie mode turned off, first gear straight up in the air, freezing cold as well with the heated grips on absolutely awesome you're not going to get a better bike than that <laughs> it's one way of waking you up the shizzle oh by the way you are the reason i recently sold my 7000s got a pair of 1210 mark twos again sold my 1200s four years ago never again prefer the analog pitch good man another tip to everybody that's watching this as well every single turntable that you see that has a physical slider or even a rotary they're all analog okay analog sliders are on every single turntable it's, everyone says, can you put digital pitch in them? It's not. The slider units are analog, okay? It's the way that the slider unit is controlled. There's a chip array of a separate quartz oscillator with two different speeds. It's the way that it's controlled. So every single turntable you see has an analog slider unit. I could put a Mark II slider unit inside a PLX 1000, a reloop. You may lose half the pitch, but you can get them in there. That's that.
Nice little uh, last thing for you. My missus loves a 250 KTM. They are wicked. I mean, I had an RC8. I love that. They kept going wrong. But that thing is phenomenal. I've had Aprilia's, RSV4s, Hayabusa's, Fireblade, put about four R1s, tons of ninjas. That's the best bike I've ever ridden. The Super Duke is the best bike I've ever ridden out of all of them. Comfy. I'm going to take it on track, really. I usually rent bikes now on track. But I'd love to take that on track. But yeah, wicked. 1,301, got to be precise with this, 1,301cc. 110 foot-pound of torque. <laughs> it's insane for a V-twin. Best bike ever in. Wheelie machine, absolute animal. In fact, I found out something quite funny. So I bought that back in July, right? After it got nicked, kept it in here for a while. Got ground anchor done, everything all on it. Finally took up to go and see my friend Mark, who ironically is a DJ. I did, I did his decks from him. He's a KTM super tech up at Jim Ames in Braintree. Massive shouts going to Jim Ames and Mark, absolute legend. Um, took the bike up there and he took one look at it and the valve cables were loose. It was throwing off an error code. My bike was running in limp mode since um, since July. It was only about three weeks ago I got it sorted. And apparently I was running off 90 brake horsepower instead of 177. Big difference. No wonder I couldn't wheelie it. That's my big complaint. Couldn't wheelie it. Can now. Oh, boy, can I wheelie it now? It's awesome. What's that last message that's come through here? Sorry. I've got, to, I've got to make a move in a minute. Tips to fix the tone arm height adjust on the 1200 as it doesn't rotate. I've already gone through that. If you go through the video after I finished, like I said, penetrant oil, keep going around it. Don't do any of this rubbish about using hair dryers. You can if you want with low heat. It may start to do it. Best, In fact, penetrant oil, Hair dryer. There you go. Just don't do it too close. Don't do it on too high of a heat. And do not use a hot air gun because you will melt all the plastic. And you do not want to do that because you'll cause yourself a world of pain. Guys, it has been wicked. It's been over three hours, this video. I'm going to keep this on here so anyone who hasn't watched this can watch it at some point at their own leisure. Thank you ever so much to everyone that's watched. Um, to all the members on here as well, all the subscribers. It's about over 5,000 of you now, I believe. So thank you ever so much. We're definitely building up this just techniques community we're building this up nicely and um i want to get this a lot bigger a lot bigger there's a lot of people that take the mickey out of me for doing what i'm doing and the way that i do things but i don't care sod them sod the haters guys you know i do the best job i can for what i can and um, that's all i'm bothered about and if that's all it takes with that that's what it is and if it goes if it goes somewhere then fantastic so thank you to everyone that's watched there will be another video um i may record a separate video of the unboxing but doing it with the camera at the side just explaining things to check out if you are buying a set of mark twos or mark fives whatever you're going to buy second hand and you're a bit unsure as to what to check if you're in someone's house so i can imagine somebody scrolling through a live video for three hours is going to really put somebody off and the whole point of this video was just to show someone how to strip one down and what the basics of parts are so yeah there'll be another video more than likely on the second one here that <laughs> I've stripped down. So um, keep your eyes on the page, guys. Thank you ever so much for watching. I'll see you on the next video. No idea how this stops this, but uh, I'm sure we'll figure this out. Take it easy, guys. I'm going to go home now. I'm hungry. <laughs> see you later, guys.